form change actually to move the maximum to the right. Mm -hmm. I'm talking normally when you're moving the maximum to this one up, but bringing the minimum density down to four units and eight point four units. I talked to staff into it. We can't do it tonight. We just want to get it away. Okay. Otherwise, we can't. I'm it's one more yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is really helpful oh, yeah. since I had not had time to do that. I am shocked at this. The, the, the neighborhood protection is almost impossible. And I don't even think what they're suggesting is meaningful. Mm -hmm. And they're turning the JCCPC into a with the power to approve or disapprove that. Uh, I don't even think it can do that. Even if only the city can only have it. It's a city council decision, not a JCCC. Mm -hmm. It is not a JCCC decision. It's just crazy. And nobody knows it's happening because the, mm -hmm. can't delay them. I didn't meet the staff of that. I thought they were going to get my packet Wednesday. Why? No. Everybody can have this, but that can risk. And they basically said they need a vote. Up or down. You know, it's also going to be a long way, you think? I've seen more. I've seen more. We are already out of time. Yeah, we can. We, we, I think we can pull a section of the, of the omnibus out and say we, we'll take that up and do more. Because uh, I don't think stakeholder groups know. Uh, I mean, we just had the attorney for a neighborhood association call the staff out directly and say that the staff's attitude towards NPOs is so hostile that it's the suggested as an alternative is there's faults and disingenuous. Um, and it's true. Uh, and then this wrong thing. Comments. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. It's good to have you here this evening. The members of the Durham Planning Commission are appointed by the City Council and the County Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. So you should know that the elected officials have the final say on any of the issues that are here before us this evening. We have a big agenda tonight, and as you'll see in a moment, we will likely move a few items around on the agenda that will require a vote of the commission. But if you are interested in speaking on any of the issues this evening, please go to the table on my left and you can sign up to speak. Uh, make sure you pay attention to which case you're signing up to speak on and you'll be asked to put down if you are speaking for or against the particular item. Each side will be given 10 minutes to speak collectively on each case before us. We do have the ability to allow additional time if a lot of people have signed up to speak. Uh, finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Uh, again, I will note that we've got a good crowd here this evening. There are still empty seats, uh, but we have been told by the fire marshal that you may stand as long as there's an empty seat in the room, but if, it, if there are no additional empty seats and you're standing in the back, you're going to be asked to get a seat or to, to go out into the hallway. Uh, but at this point, we're in good shape. So thank you all again. May I have the roll call, please? Before I call the roll, I wanted to just announce that the following members have requested an excused absence, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Brine, and Ms. Satterfield. Commissioner Alturk? Here. Commissioner Baker? Here. Commissioner Durkin? Uh, Commissioner Hyman? Present. Chair Busby? Here. Commissioner Miller? Here. Commissioner Ketchen? Here. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Commissioner Gibbs? Here. And Commissioner Williams? Here. Great, thank you. If we could have a motion for the three excused absences. So moved. Second. Okay. Properly moved by Commissioner Miller and seconded by Vice Chair Hyman for excused absences for uh, Commissioners Brine, Johnson, and Satterfield. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, the ayes have it. 
We'll move to the approval of the minutes and the consistency statements from our September 11th, 2018 meeting. Are there any comments or changes to the minutes and the consistency statements? Seeing none, we'll accept a motion for approval. Motion to approve agenda and consistency statements as presented. And a second? Moved by Vice Chair Hyman, seconded by Commissioner Gibbs. My uh, staff would ask for one correction, um, yes. uh, approval of the minutes and consistency statements, not the agenda. Ms. Hyman has said That's approval I, of the agenda. So oh, we're asking for approval of the minutes, minutes and the consistency yes. statements. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Great, so this vote is for approval of the minutes and the consistency statement. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Before we get to adjustments to the agenda, any updates from the staff? Um, no updates or adjustments from the staff. We would like to add that all public hearing items have been advertised and noticed in accordance with UDO and state law, and affidavits for those advertisements are on file in the planning department. Thank you very much. So as we look at the agenda this evening, we have a few items that may take a little bit of time, and we also have uh, recognition for two former planning commissioners. So what I would like to propose, and I'm open to friendly amendments from my fellow commissioners, would be to rearrange the agenda so we would start with recognizing the service of former commissioners Ghosh and Van at the very beginning. And then we can move into our agenda items. We have two items where I know a lot of folks are here for two different cases this evening. That is the Forest Hills Future Land Use Amendment and the Pinecrest Development. We also have two items that I believe are, I believe, we always say this and we're sometimes surprised, but we have two items that we believe are relatively uncontroversial. <laughs> the Shell Oil Gas Station and the West Point at 751 revisions. So I would like to suggest that we would move our recognition of the planning commissioners to the very top of the agenda, that we would look to combine the hearings uh, one, one at a time, but the Forest Hills future land use and the Pinecrest to happen back to back. But we could also uh, look to move the Shell Oil gas station and the West Point at 751 revisions to the top of our agenda. Did everyone follow that? Yep. So we, we Commissioner Rothberg? No, go ahead. Okay. Is that, if folks are open to that, I would. Did you say move these to the top of the agenda? Yeah, so I will say it again, just so okay. we can be clear, because there are a lot of, lot of parts here. We would move the recognition of our two former planning commissioners to the very top, okay. followed by the Shell Oil gas station then the West Point at 751, then the Forest Hills Flum, followed by Pinecrest, then the Romp, and then finally the Omnibus 12. Okay. And that way we can work through some of the non-controversial items. Those of you that are here for two cases in a row will be able to hear those right away, and then we can, we can finish with the Omnibus 12. Commissioner Miller? Mr. Chairman, um, with all due respect, I don't have any difficulty with recognizing the, the two former commission members because that won't take long, and I believe they deserve an audience. But with regard, and I don't mind moving, putting the two Forest Hills related items back to back. But in terms of making everybody in the room sit through the cases you characterize as non controversial when they are probably here for other cases, I think we need to take the business of the of the majority of the people who are here up as close to the top of the agenda as we can. Uh, I would rather have a smaller number of people waiting. <laughs> so we ask that you actually not have uh, signs of affection during the hearing, <laughs> but your message has been heard. So I'm open to that as well. So uh, would you like to make a motion to that effect, Commissioner Miller? Mr. Chairman, I would like to move that we begin with recognition of former commission members and then uh, we take the two Forest Hills cases, uh, and then we follow that with the, um, the rail maintenance facility case, and then finish up with the Shell Station and the West Point at 751 revisions, and then, uh, and then finally the, uh, the text amendment omnibus number 12. We have a second? 
Second. Second. All right, moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion for the revised agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you. We will move on with our two recognitions. I'm going to come to the microphone here at the front, and I would ask Commissioners Ghosh and Van, former commissioners, but always commissioners in our heart, to come join us. I'm going to read each resolution into the record. We'll start with Mr. Van. This is a resolution in appreciation of Mr. Andre Van. Whereas Mr. Andre D. Van was a member of the Durham Planning Commission from July 27th, 2015 through August 14th, 2018. And whereas the Durham Planning Commission and the citizens of the city and county of Durham have benefited from the dedicated efforts that he displayed while serving as a member of the Durham Planning Commission, and whereas this commission desires to express its appreciation for the public of a job well done, now therefore be it resolved by the Durham Planning Commission that this commission does hereby express its sincere appreciation for the service rendered by Mr. Van to the citizens of this community, and that the clerk for the commission is hereby directed to spread this resolution in its entirety upon the official minutes of this commission, and this resolution is hereby presented to Mr. Van as a token of the high esteem held for him adopted this ninth day of October, 2018. Thank you to um, Chair Busby and Vice Chair Hyman and my colleagues here. And, uh, and of course, I always have to thank uh, Mr. David Harrison because he's the one who reminded me about all this, this great work that goes on. And I, I'm just privileged um, for the opportunity to uh, have been able to serve. I'll be moving over to a little city board um, in preparation for Durham's 150th anniversary. And I uh, want to focus all my energies there. And, um, but I, again, again, I'm thankful for the great work. And I think Durham has benefited greatly from the work of my colleagues here, um, those who serve um, and know best, help to serve and make this community what it is today. And so I'm appreciative of that. And I thank you very much. And in addition, a resolution in appreciation of Mr. Indranil Ghosh, whereas Mr. Indranil Ghosh was a member of the Durham Planning Commission from June 22nd, 2015 through August 14th, 2018. And whereas the Durham Planning Commission and the citizens of the, and the city and county of Durham have benefited from the dedicated efforts that he displayed while serving as a member of the Durham Planning Commission. And whereas this commission desires to ex express its appreciation for the public of a job well done, now therefore be it resolved by the Durham Planning Commission, that this commission does hereby express its sincere appreciation for the service rendered by Mr. Ghosh to the citizens of this community, and that the clerk for the commission is hereby directed to spread this resolution in its entirety upon the minutes of this commission, and this resolution is hereby presented to Mr. Ghosh as a token of the high esteem held for him, adopted this ninth day of October, 2018. Thank you. So I see they got my full name in there. That's that was yeah. I wasn't expecting that. Um, yet I really enjoyed serving on the planning commission, um, Mr. Baker. I think you're sitting where I used to sit. I haven't met you yet, but I did look over your resume and was uh, very impressed with your credentials. And I look forward to the great work that this planning commission has done and will continue to do in the future. I see you guys are missing a few commissioners today. Just I'm in the audience. Let me know if you need me to hop up here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if it's uh, permitted, I'd like to move that the Planning Commission adopt the two resolutions that you read into the minutes. That is appropriate. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. That is unanimous. We are moving on to our first case again. We've moved items around, but we are starting with case A18, quadruple zero four. This is the, Hor the Forest Hills future land use map. And this was continued from two months ago. And as I was required to do two months ago, I will again ask to recuse myself. I live in the mail zone, the mail notification zone for the future land use amendment. So I am required by our uh, rules to recuse myself. So I will ask for that vote, and then once that is approved, we will turn 
the, uh, the chair to Vice Chair Hyman for this particular case. I will note, because I will be back after this case, is that I do not live in the mail zone for the next case, Z18 quadruple zero nine for Pinecrest. So I'm in an interesting spot. I have conferred with staff and I am indeed required to vote on that amendment. If I abstained, I would my vote would count as a yes vote according to our rules of procedure. So I will be back to chair that discussion and I will be voting on that particular item. But I will accept a motion for recusal on this case. Mr. Chairman, I move that we disqualify you from consideration of case A18 quadruple zero four, the Forest Hills future land use map changes. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes. Vice Chair Hyman. Thank you, Mr. Busby. Uh, we'll proceed with the um, staff report for this particular issue. Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department. Um, staff has no further information on this item, um, but is available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I do have uh, two individuals who have signed up to speak. Yes. Um, the applicant. Let me see. It's like I have to adjust my glasses. Is that James Speed Rogers? No, he's against. Okay, he's against. And then uh, Neil Ghosh. <laughs> okay, what a surprise. I did promise you all I would be back here in front of you at this podium. I didn't realize how soon. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Neil Ghosh. I'm an attorney with the Morning Star Law Group, and we uh, represent the applicant for this Flum Amendment. Um, I will note that when we filed this application, I was on the Planning Commission. I'm not aware of any rule that would disqualify me from representing them in front of this board now that I'm no longer on the Planning Commission. Um, since our first meeting at the Planning Commission, we've had an opportunity to meet and work with the developers of the Pinecrest project, uh, which is later on in your agenda. It's the next uh, item. Through our meetings, we have been able to help shape that project in a way we think... That was quick. We've been able Continue, to uh, help shape that project in a way we think will be more consistent with the neighborhood. Unfortunately, while we've made great strides with the Pinecrest project, we've not had an opportunity to digest all of the feedback we got uh, from our neighbors and the staff and from you all on our own application. Uh, and we recognize that there are some legitimate concerns which have been raised, not only by the developers of Pinecrest, but also by some of our neighbors and the planning staff as well. Uh, usually, the Planning Commission is tied to a 90-day window uh, from the opening of the public hearing to make a decision, but in this case, we, the applicant, are requesting to have our application referred back to staff so that we can work with them to amend our application in a way that hopefully they can support and which will address some of the concerns that were raised by other folks. Um, and let me be clear, we are not withdrawing our application, and we fully intend to see this through to a vote at City Council. It just is the case uh, that we recognize there may be a need to amend portions of our application in order to gain the support of more people and hopefully of the staff as well. Uh, obviously, when the time comes, we will hope to have your support as well, but for now, we ask that you refer this item back to staff to allow us more time to work on our application. Uh, we will be back at some point, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. I do have another individual who has signed up to speak, and that's James Speed Rogers. Um, good evening, and uh, thank you to the members of the commission. Um, my name is James Speed Rogers. I live at 1007 Drew Street here in Durham. Um, and I am just here to remind you that Durham is facing a housing crisis. We um, have 20 people moving to Durham almost every day. We have over 900 evictions per month, um, and rents are rising all over the city. Um, we have to uh, 
uh, we have to address supply issues if we are going to take the displacement and gentrification concerns of the community seriously. Um, we need to increase missing middle housing um, and particularly need to increase that missing middle housing on transit corridors and close to job hubs like downtown. Um, the Flume amendments, to my understanding, do the opposite. They reduce the uh, potential density uh, of the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, I just would like to ask the commission why we are limiting housing options when we should be expanding them. Um, it is my hope that you will vote against this downzoning. Um, Durham needs more housing. Thank you. Thank you. I do not have other individuals who have signed up to speak on this issue. If there are other people who wish to speak um, while the public hearing is open, hearing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and give the mission, members of the commission an opportunity to speak. I'll start to my right. Are there any commissioners who would like to speak? Uh, Commissioner Miller. Madam Chairman, at the um, end of our meeting last month, uh, Commission Member Brine uh, proposed an idea, at least to a couple of commission members, and I think also acquainted the staff with it, uh, as his uh, approach to this idea of a Forest Hills future land use map change. It was an idea based upon uh, looking at the problem as a question of uh, the text and tables of the comprehensive plan and uh, not so much a change of the, of the uh, future land use maps or the tier boundaries. Um, and I believe that his ideas uh, deserve some serious consideration and massaging by everybody involved. And for that reason, and consonant with the request uh, made by Mr. Ghosh, I'm going to ask that we continue our consideration of this request until our December meeting, which I believe, believe is currently scheduled for the 11th. Mr. Miller, the applicant actually requested that it be referred back to staff so that they could make the modifications and bring it back. All right, then the that's, what, that's my motion, isn't Great. it? Great, thank that you. the matter be referred to staff. Can I get a motion to that? Um, that's my motion. Okay, can I get a second? Second. It has been moved and properly second that we refer this item back to staff for some additional adjustments. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by um, raising your right hand, please. All opposed? Motion passes eight to zero. Uh, thank oh, I'm sorry, you. eight to one. <laughs> Thank you. We'll take a second to transition to Mr. Busby as he walks back to his seat. Thank you, Vice Chair Hyman. We will move to our next case again. We amended the agenda at the beginning. We next will be here in case Z18 quadruple zero nine for Pinecrest, and we will start with the staff report. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number Z180009, which is Pinecrest. The applicant is Pinecrest Duke LLC. The subject site is generally located at 1050 West Forest Hills Boulevard, and it is 9.11 acres in size. It is located within the city's jurisdiction. The rezoning request is residential suburban to plan development <coughs> residential uh, 6.0, PDR 6.0. Uh, 
The property is located within the medium density residential future land use designation, which is consistent with this rezoning request. <clears throat> the proposal is to rezone the property to allow up to 46 dwelling units. This is the aerial map and the subject site is shown in red. It is located within the urban development tier and within the Cape Fear River Basin. This is the existing conditions map and it includes uh, properties um, 1050 West Forest Hills Boulevard, 1010, 1010 West Wood Drive, 1413 Kent Street, a portion of 1409 Kent Street, 1401 Bivens Street, and 1444, I'm sorry, uh, 1044 West Forest Hills Boulevard. The majority of the site contains mixed hardwood species and pines, uh, ranging in size and understory trees to large canopy trees. Um, and this map shows the existing conditions, um, house, uh, driveway, pools, patios, various accessory structures, a stream buffer, no build area, existing easements, um, as well as uses that are adjacent to the site. Included within the staff report are um, various pictures of uh, the site conditions, as well as um, area conditions uh, surrounding the Pine Crest development site are single family homes on a mix of large and small wooded lots ranging in size from two tenths to an acre to over one acre in size, as well as the Forest Hills Park and the nearby um, Lions Park. <coughs> this is the um, zoning context map. On the left side is the existing conditions. The property is shown in red. Um, and it is shown in the existing residential suburban uh, 20 zoning district. And on the right, it's highlighted uh, in blue with the proposed PDR 6.0. The future land use map shows the area shown in orange as medium density residential, which is six to 12 dwelling units per acre, um, which is consistent with the rezoning request. The um, next slide shows the proposed conditions. This is the uh, development plan, which highlights site access points, project boundary buffers, the building and parking envelopes, tree coverage areas, um, and the maximum impervious coverage. I'm gonna highlight some of the key commitments that are, have been included as part of the development plan. There is a maximum, setting a max of um, 46 dwelling units, uh, converting the existing single family dwelling into two dwelling units, dedicating a 50 foot wide uh, greenway easement, specifying no commercial uses on the property, substituting natural buffers for the project boundary buffers, stipulating no public streets or public or private drives, excuse me, and executing a utility extension agreement prior to site plan approval. There have been some um, text commitments that have been reviewed and approved by staff since the posting of the staff report, and they have been now been incorporated as part of this application. First being single family detached dwellings and or townhouses shall be the permitted building types. Um, the uh, text commitment number two which pertain to recessed buildings located along Westwood Drive and Kent Street was removed. Text commitment number 14 was revised to read all new water and sewer mains um, shall be private and the utilities shall not be owned, operated or maintained by the city of Durban, Durham. Uh, two additional text commitments were included Common access easements shall be constructed to provide necessary access for fire and, and solid waste vehicles in accordance with local and state regulations. Design of utility systems shall meet local and state regulations. A single driveway connection shall be provided at the intersection of Westwood Drive, West Forest Hills Boulevard, subject to city approval um, at site plan stage. So this connection not, be not approved, the driveway shall be provided at the alternative location shown on the development plan sheet number two. In terms of some of the design commitments that have been included on the plan, um, the residents 
will be built in colonial revival, federal and Tudor, Tudor styles, um, found uh, in the similar to the um, Forest Hills neighborhood to complement the architecture of um, the residence. The structures will utilize a variety of building materials and architectural features to complement the surrounding residential development. All residential development units um, along the existing public right of way shall be prohibited from having direct vehicular access to the existing roadways. And a, um, an additional text a graph, a design commitment was added. Townhouses shall not be located within 50 feet of any existing public right of way. In terms of consistency with the comprehensive plan and policies, the proposed PDR zoning designation complies with the current medium density residential six to 12 dwelling units designation on the future land use map. It is consistent with policies 223A, as if approved, the development plan would yield 46 dwelling units on the plan. In terms of 231, a, the applicant is proposing single family and townhouses. No commercial uses will be allowed. The applicant has added design commitments to address the appearance of the structures to be built, um, to be built in the same style as the Forest Hills neighborhood and to complement the neighborhood architecture. Existing infrastructure such as roads, water, and sewer capacity are sufficient to accommodate the potential impacts. The proposed development is consistency. It's consistent with policies 814B and 1014F, and that the applicant has dedicated a 50-foot-wide greenway easement on the development plan to address the requirements of the city's greenway and open space master plan. In terms of policy 814D, Transportation had previously proposed adding a bicycle facility along Kent Street. However, at that time, the neighbors were in support of maintaining the existing on-street parking. Um, since no roadway widening is needed um, in this particular development plan, there are no improvements required of the, de required of the developer. The proposed development plan is consistent with 11.1. B policy, there is sufficient capacity within the school systems to accommodate the anticipated growth. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. At this point, we will open the public hearing for this case, and we have 10 individuals who have signed up all to speak in favor of this proposal. Now, as I said at the beginning, we traditionally, our rules have us give 10 minutes to each side, 10 minutes for and 10 minutes against, but we can decide to allow additional time to allow people to have time to speak. Commissioner Miller. Mr. Chairman, uh, given the circumstances that we have 10 speakers on one side and to make sure that our public hearing uh, works to give everybody who comes to speak an adequate opportunity to get their points across to us, I move that we give all the speakers who have signed up to speak two minutes. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. So we're going to call you up to speak one at a time. If you can come up and speak clearly into the microphone, if you can give us your name and your mailing address, and then you'll see there's two minutes on the timer. You cannot miss the beep when it starts beeping. That means it's time to wrap up. Uh, we will start with Ken Spaulding and then George Stanziel, and I'll call up additional names as we go. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Ken Spaulding. I represent the applicant uh, who is seeking to get a rezoning of Pinecrest, which is the estate of Dr. Mary Siemens and of the Duke family. We're seeking to rezone 9.1 acres to have a PDR-6. The family wanted this use of Dr. Siemens estate to be developed as a special place in a special neighborhood. We are creating a place respecting the life, the heritage, the legacy, and the, tra and the tradition 
of the Duke and Seaman's family. We also wanted to respect the wishes of the city of Durham through your comprehensive plan and the neighborhoods adjacent, Long Meadow and Forest Hills. We have given our most earnest and sincere efforts to reach these goals. We've had to weigh and juggle our policies and procedures of the city and the county with the needs of the residents and neighbors. Since our last meeting, we have had four different types of meetings with neighbors and residents, still trying to work things out. That, you add to the 15 meetings that we've had over a year's period of time, is a total of 19 meetings. We have worked extremely hard to be able to come to a consensus on this. And I want to give the Longmeadow neighborhood and the Forest Hill neighborhood credit for working diligently with us, recognizing there were some things we could do and some things we could not do. And we recognized there were things that they needed and wanted that we wanted to make sure that we could address and give them. We feel we have created a future place which will be unique to Durham, the Triangle, and the state of North Carolina. Wave time. I'll, I'll wave my time as well. Mr. Chunk? You're waving your two minutes? Okay, thank you. We've had specific goals of making sure we had proper buffering. We've respected our ecologic and our environmental aspects. We've tried to see that our future houses would be comparable to the existing homes through committed architectural guidelines, which will be a part of the text commitments. We have a strategic array of homes in a strategic location. We are respectful of the estate's natural beauty. We strive to have a preservation of history through the use of some of the existing structures on the premises today. Staff has assessed our adherence to our city's policies, our city's rules, our city's plans, and our city's procedures. We therefore respectfully request your approval and support for this rezoning, which is in full compliance. More specifics will be given by our land planner, Mr. George Stanzel of Stewart. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Uh, Chair and members of the commission. My name is George Stanzial. I'm president and director of design at Stewart, and I live at uh, 115 Cofield Circle in Durham. Uh, as a follow-up to Mr. Spaulding's very uh, on-point comments, in addition to the 19 meetings we've had with neighbors over the course of the past year and a half, uh, we've worked very closely with the Durham Neighbors Together group uh, and have reached a lengthy agreement with them on a number of items uh, such as density and residential housing types, boundary buffers, uh, a path along the existing stream, entrance relocation, architectural guidelines, as well as um, our intention uh, to seek a 20%, up to 20% reduction of density at uh, site plan approval, uh, which will uh, keep us in compliance with the comprehensive plan policies. Uh, our effective uh, density at that point would be 4.17 uh, units per acre uh, and uh, very consistent with surrounding densities in both Forest Hills and Longmeadow. Uh, immediately across the street um, from our project on Kent Street. While we completely understand that DNT does not represent all of Forest Hills, we have listened to all the neighbors and incorporated many of the conditions and requests we have heard from them uh, on a consistent basis. Uh, this, um, these have been included uh, in our development plan text commitments. Uh, in addition, though, I'd like to read into the record uh, three additional text commitments um, that have been approved uh, by the plan, pre-approved by the planning department. First, single-family homes will be served and accessed by a private access and common area, drives and parking areas. These private accesses and common areas do not meet the city of Durham street standards. The features within this area are private and will never be uh, eligible for public maintenance. Furthermore, the developer agrees to note this on all site plans. Mr. Coleman, I waste my time. 
Right, Mr. Coleman has waived his two minutes. Thank you. Furthermore, the developer agrees to note this on all site plans, construction do, uh, drawings, and final plats, and include this language in our restrictive covenants prior to recording of the final plat. Second, uh, a, a maximum five foot wide trail with a natural surface will be constructed along the east side of the stream uh, on site uh, and will extend outside the zoning boundary on parcels PID 201749 and parcels 201750 to connect to Bivens Street and Forest View Street rights of ways. Should a greenway be built uh, per the Durham Trails and Greenway Master Plan, the natural trail will be removed and replaced with the, with the, uh, the new trail. And then thirdly, a 20-foot uh, boundary buffer shall be provided along Westwood Drive and West Forest Hills uh, Boulevard. That's an increase from 15 feet to 20 feet. We are hopeful that you will see that we've truly made an outstanding effort to understand and be empathetic toward the, uh, our neighbors' concerns and feedback and that you will feel that uh, this will be a high quality and you com a unique community in Durham and most likely in the Triangle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speakers are Bo Clark, Peter Jacoby, Connie Siemens, and I. Jarvis Martin. And then finally, John Burnesh and Dan Getz. If you can. I'm Bo Clark, and I don't need to speak. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, thank you for your service to Durham. I am Peter Jacoby. My wife, Sandra, and I live at 19 Oak Drive in Forest Hills for 30 years. We strongly support the proposed development of the Pinecrest property and the rezoning request by Philip Clark Builders. The Pinecrest development proposal before you preserves this unique and historic property. It also successfully provides well-designed new housing inventory within Forest Hills. Mr. Clark's vision respects and is open to the surrounding neighborhood. This goal would simply not be met by subdividing the property into individual building lots. I also want to thank Durham Neighbors Together for engaging with Mr. Clark to make this a better development and for focusing on the future impacts of new urban housing in Forest Hills. In future years, I believe Forest Hills and Durham residents will walk through the new Pinecrest with family and visitors. This, they will say, is the best urban housing development in Durham. Thank you. Thank you. Connie Siemens. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Connie Siemens, and I live at 1514 Hermitage Court. I have been a resident of Forest Hills for 12 years. I'm a cousin to James Siemens, the current owner of the Pinecrest property. I'm also a professional real estate broker. Ah, uh, you might say she's in real estate, so she's obviously pro-development. Well, that's not exactly true. Uh, when the Pinecrest project was first introduced to us about this time last year, I was a little skeptical and I was concerned. I was concerned for my family, for the neighborhood, for the historical record, and for the property itself. Over many months of conversations and presentations by and with Phil Clark and his team, as well as researching and evaluating many of his previous projects, I have come to admire and support Mr. Clark's vision for Pinecrest. He truly wants an addition to our neighborhood that reflects the timeless beauty, heritage, and architectural details already present in the neighborhood, as well as deliver a level of craftsmanship and construction that are not commonly found in new construction today. Will the development require some sacrifice? Of course, change is often hard. But the Pinecrest project also offers opportunity. Opportunity for much needed urban density, the creation of a beautiful residential destination, as well as preservation. Preservation of the historic structures, 
preservation of architectural design, and preservation of green spaces. I firmly believe that the Pine Coast Project is the best possible development outcome, both for the neighborhood and the city. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jarvis Martin. Good evening. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, first, uh, let me say thank you to all of you for your service. Haven't had the opportunity for over eight years to sit where you all have sit on the second Tuesday of each month. I well understand the personal sacrifice and commitment that you give to your service, and it is greatly appreciated, and because of that, Durham is a better place. With that in mind, uh, over the years that I had the good fortune to serve, one of the things that all of the commissioners hoped for and wished for was that developers would work with and listen to the residents when they came to the developments that they were proposing for our neighborhoods. I can say in this case, based upon the feedback that I have gotten in talking to the development team, that they have put forth a sincere effort to do that, and many of the concerns of the residents have been met, which have been stated earlier before. Uh, as a professional, I am a certified state real estate appraiser. I can say that based upon what information I have been shown about the project, that this development will blend very well with the existing homes in the uh, Forest Hill community, as well as add a new dimension for folks to, to consider this as a place that they want to live. Because of those facts, I'm asking you to support this rezoning tonight. Thank you. Thank you. John Burnesh and Dan Getz, please. Members of the commission, my name is John Burness. I live at 1506 Kent Street with my wife, Ann, um, and I believe we probably have the most frontage of any property that is adjacent to the uh, Pinecrest site. Uh, I've lived in Forest Hill since coming to Duke in 1990. Um, typical of Durham, there were many views on this project when it was first presented. And while I was not involved in the negotiations, I'm very glad to see that the neighbors opposed to it were able to gain changes that I think improve the project and appreciate that the developers were open and willing to respond to many of the community's concerns. Knowing Mary and Jim Stevens, as I was privileged to do, I think they would be pleased with the end result. And I urge you to support this application for the Pinecrest development. Thank you. Thank you, Burness. Mr. Burness, and I'm sorry for pronouncing your name wrong earlier. Speaking of pronouncing names wrong, Mr. Dan Getz, how did I do? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the commission, uh, good evening. My name is Dan Getz. I live at 1414 Shepherd Street in Durham, and I'm here to support the proposed rezoning. For 30 years, I've lived in Forest Hills, three blocks from the Pinecrest Estate. For those many years, I've biked, walked, and driven around the property whenever headed west. This past Saturday was the first time that I set foot on the property after attending multiple meetings with my neighbors, with design experts, planning staff, and with Phil Clark's team. I've come away respecting the process and thankful for the many chances to interact with and learn from one and all. My conclusion to support the development comes down to three core points. First, trust. Trust that the Siemens family has acted in good faith in engaging a responsible developer, a developer who has engaged with the local officials and neighbors to improve the initial plans. Two, confidence. Confidence that the planned development is consistent with the larger public consensus in Durham, that we need more housing options, 
near the city center to create a more dense urban core. Finally, three, concern. Concern that failure to approve the proposal would jeopardize chances to transform Pinecrest from an outsized and isolated island into a vibrant asset that will benefit the neighborhood and the city. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So that concludes the speakers who have signed up to speak, but I have seen a lot of folks come in. I do want to give anyone an opportunity if they would like to speak during this public hearing. This is the Pinecrest zoning map change case. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? I'm not seeing anyone, so I'm going to move to close the public hearing and bring it back to the commissioners for any questions or comments. Are there commissioners with questions or comments? We can start to my right. Commissioner Al Turk. Oh, you have a piece of shoe. Okay. Commissioner Al Turk. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions for staff. One is relatively minor for clarification. In attachment six, in the last section there, you mentioned a, um, an increase of five students. Is that supposed to be nine? Or I think you had nine in the table. I'm just, again, it's, it's a minor clarification question. Let me just get to the table. Okay. That would be the correct number. Okay. I think the table says nine, so I'm, assume, I'm gonna assume that's the... I would go with that then. Okay. Um, my, my second question is, what does it mean if, for a developer to, to um, ask for a buy right 20% density reduction at site plan? I mean, can anyone do this, or are there requirements? Because that has been discussed, and George yes, mentioned the, that. So the development plan does not specify any reduction in terms of the 20 percent it is um, a provision that anyone can um, apply for at the time of site plan but when you say apply for does uh, I mean would could they get could they be denied that request or is that really unlikely I'm sorry, I apologize. I wanted to clarify that the 20% is actually um, referred to in the section about development plans, that you can do that without that sort of change or that 20% reduction being considered a significant change that would require rezoning. I see. So it's, it's applicable to development plans, approved development plans. But, so they would have to put that in the development plan for it? No. No. Okay. They can do it at some right. time of site plan. Got if it. they do not exceed 20% right. reduction, they would not have to come back through the approval process. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so I guess for George, I'd, if you could, um, I have a couple questions for you. So you mentioned that you have an agreement <coughs> with the, the Durham Neighbors Together, right, group. And you mentioned three things, I guess, uh, some agreement on density, this density reduction, increased buffers, or something about buffers, and then architectural guidelines. Could you... Be more specific about those, sure. what exactly you're proposing, what you've agreed to? Sure. So what, what we've agreed to on the density is, um, is, is a number of units. The neighbors were concerned about not only the area that we were zoning, but what would happen on the remainder of the, of the property, um, which, is, which is zoned RS-20. On that property, there are, there are two homes, the existing mansion, the main uh, home, which we are going to uh, turn into two flats, two, so two units. And then there's an existing cottage that is outside of our zoning area, but is part of the Pinecrest estate. We will be um, uh, redoing that, that cottage. Okay. Um, and then there are some other, there are several other lots uh, that homes could be built on. In the R, under the RS20 zoning. And we've agreed to build only two more. The, potentially four could have been built. We've agreed to build only two. Okay. So 
we've agreed to a total of 41 units over the entire Pinecrest property, both on and off our zoning, our zoning area, um, including the home, the main, the main manor house, and the, and the cottage. Uh, is that? Yeah, on the density question, that's, thank you. Uh, the second one, what, um, I forget, the boundary buffer. Right. Uh, so there is a required boundary buffer um, for this project, um, and it's 15 feet. Uh, we've agreed with uh, with DNT to increase that to 20 feet. And I forget the third one, I'm sorry. Architectural guidelines. Oh, the guidelines. So I guess, is that the text commitment already in the development plan? No, that's one I just read okay. into tonight. And, you... and then the architectural guidelines, um, the, uh, uh, the neighbors were concerned about, you know, uh, what these homes would look like, uh, what are the architectural features and so forth. We described that to some extent in the in our in our design uh, commitments um, it, basic style mm -hmm. but they wanted something further and they wanted it to be um, they wanted uh, architectural guidelines that could be uh, recorded uh, with the county and and become essentially go with the land so we provided to them an, uh, an additional set of guidelines that they've accepted um, that will be recorded. Okay. I guess my bigger question is, what kind of agreement is this? I mean, is this a legally binding agreement that... It, it's a legally binding agreement between two LLCs. Okay. And if they back out, then, I mean, if at some point they... I, I guess my, my concern is, so I, with the density reduction, I understand that you're trying to fit in with the 6 to 12 units because of the flum, and then at, at site plan, you'll reduce it. But I, I guess I'm wondering why not commit to the increased buffer and the architectural guidelines in the agreement now, right? Well, we did. 20, we, or we did. 20-foot buffer, for example. Now. We did. Okay. That's one of the ones I, I read into the record. I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what you've read into the record is based on the agreement you have with... Yes. Okay, so sorry. There were, too many, there were a lot of... Yeah. All right. Okay. And that and that will be made. Um, that will be made. That is now a, uh, becomes a part of the the development plan. So those three additional committed elements become okay. part of the development plan. I see. All right. And go with the property. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for clarifying that. I'll, um, I have no further questions at this point. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner Miller. I also wanted to address that. Um, so tonight we've learned that. Uh, this developer has made some agreements that are outside the scope of a rezoning case, the public rezoning case that, that is the, the subject of our concern and the only subject of our concern tonight. We should not consider these when we decide whether or not to approve the rezoning application that has been submitted and modified by these uh, several des uh, uh, commitments that have to be included in the development plan. So what we have before us tonight is an application uh, to rezone this property to a PDR to allow up to 46 units. Um, there are a whole bunch of commitments, commitments to preserve historic structures, uh, commitments concerning buffers, commitments concerning design of units. All of those are in there. We've heard about some other agreements that the, that the developers made with his neighbors. These are appropriate, uh, and they can range from a handshake to an enforceable contract, but they're not our concern. Even the uh, agreement to request the 20% uh, reduction, which our code does allow all developers to ask for at site plan times. We build this into the code uh, because when we get a property rezoned and there are commitments in a development plan, you go to site plan and, and you start working with the staff and you start looking at the site and you discover that you may need a little leeway. Well, we build that leeway into the development uh, into the site plan process um, and what the code allows is is that as long as this a as long as the leeway isn't significant then it's okay it's by right it doesn't it's not something that can be approved or disapproved but if it's more than a certain amount uh, then it's a rezoning and you have to start all over again for housing density uh, the breakpoint between uh, 
uh, significant and not significant is 20 percent. Uh, but the case before us is for 46 units. Uh, and if you are comfortable with 46 units, you should vote for this rezoning. If you're not comfortable with 46 units, then uh, you should ask more questions or perhaps vote against it. For my own part, uh, I am comfortable with 46 units on the nine acres. Now, George also spoke about the developer owns about, if I'm not mistaken, 12 acres, all contiguous, that are the, the, the Pinecrest property. The rezoning only covers about 9.11 acres. So there are some other parts of the property which the developer will be able to develop, but at the existing RS-20 zoning. Uh, what happens on those three acres, not before us tonight, not something we should take into account in deciding whether or not to approve this rezoning. Uh, I am immensely grateful uh, to the developer and to the neighbors for working through a difficult process uh, and coming up with an elaborate plan, uh, but. Uh, all the same, a very good one. And I believe that when this project is finished, um, we will have in Durham something, a type of development that will broaden the scope of development uh, that we have seen here over the years to include something uh, that we've not seen before. And I hope uh, the effect of it will be to influence and affect uh, other developers, not only in what they build, but in the way they deal with their neighbors. Uh, one of my reasons for being on the Planning Commission is to make sure that the community is fully engaged in the planning process, one that is complicated, one that is expensive, one by its nature is alienating to people. Uh, we have overcome all of those things in this case, and so I'm voting for it. Uh, I, the gentleman talked about trust. Uh, I'm a person who uh, cuts the cards even when he plays with friends. Uh, and we've done that in this case, uh, but still, I trust that uh, and am confident uh, that everybody here has acted in good faith and that we will have a really good addition to, to Durham on an interesting piece of property. Uh, so I'm voting for it, and I encourage all of the rest of you to do the same. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Miller. Commissioner Williams and then Commissioner Gibbs. Is that right? Okay. Commissioner Gibbs. Okay, I, uh, I got all uh, involved in, uh, in the previous uh, descriptions of things, uh, and I agree with just about everything that's been said so far, uh, and I have been particularly impressed with, uh, I did get to see uh, a planned study, uh, I guess you may could call it design development or something, and I was particularly impressed with that. And uh, Commissioner Miller alluded to that in the latter part of his statement. Uh, and I, the way they have worked, the developer has worked with the Forest Hills residents uh, is is very encouraging, but as far as the design of this piece of land, uh, again, I agree with Commissioner Miller. Uh, it's something that's unique, and it's not going to be cheap housing. It's going to be something that is compatible and would be an absolute great addition to the overall Forest Hill persona. And, and I think in doing that, it should strengthen uh, its position at, to maintain its historic status. And I know it hasn't been designated as a historic area but it would make it pretty doggone hard for anybody, any other developer to come in and infill develop what's up on the, I call it up on the hill of Forest Hills. Uh, and I, I just wanted to offer that general uh, comment. And I uh, thank you, Commissioner Miller, for uh, 
I couldn't say it as well as you did, but uh, I will be voting for this because I think it it sets a precedent and a pattern that uh, I, I hope to see more of this kind of development. And it can be used for uh, affordable housing, too. Of course, this is affordable uh, if you make a million bucks a year. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's all. I've spoken enough. Thank you, Thank you. Commissioner Gibbs. Commissioner Williams? Um, I'm utterly impressed by this process and how it has turned out. Um, I believe that the charrette process for this had to be extensive and it really took a collaborative effort. And um, knowing what I know of Forest Hills and the city of Durham, I feel like what you have before us is a very strong commitment. It's a very strong actual effort to produce something that is to be proud of. And this has come a long way. And I, I'm smiling a lot because I'm elated from what I've heard and from where this started and where we are now. So I am very proud to support this. Thank you very much. I will echo those statements as well. I think I was at the first neighborhood meeting, the very big one. I arrived a few minutes late and it was already tense. And if you had told me that a year later there would be 10 people speaking in favor and it would potentially be a unanimous vote of the Planning Commission, I would have been very skeptical. Everyone involved has worked really hard, the neighbors, the proponents. I know there have been an enormous amount of meetings. I've been in a few of the meetings and this is a very strong proposal. Uh, Mr. Martin, former planning commissioner, I think said it well, is these are the kind of solutions that we like to see where everyone listens to each other and works really hard together. So I'm impressed as well. I look forward to voting for it. And in fact, this is the appropriate time for a motion. So I will accept a motion for approval. Mr. Chairman, I move that we send case number Z18000009, the Pinecrest case, forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation Subject to uh, nine proffered items. Um, so, and I'm going to break these down and ask you to, to remember them. Uh, five of the items that I'm going to discuss tonight, uh, discuss in the motion are, were actually proffered by the developer and approved by staff and described by staff in their presentation. Four of them were new items and one was modification of an existing commitment in the development plan. Then later, uh, during the public hearing, Mr. Stanzial, on behalf of the developer, proffered three more uh, committed elements. So altogether, that is nine the way I count it. Uh, and so my motion is, is to send this forward to the council with a favorable recommendation subject to the commitments in the original application plus the additional night items tonight. Second. Second. It moved by Commissioner Miller. We'll give the second to Commissioner Alturk. I do, before we discuss and vote, I do want to make sure that the staff and the proponents are in agreement on the motion on the proffers. That's correct. Okay. Lots of heads nodding. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we'll have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Keenshin? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. All right. Motion passes 9-0. Thank you very much. Thank you again to everybody for your work on this particular case. Can we take a couple of minutes? We're, we're going to take just a, a two-minute standing break just so we can clear the room so that when we begin our next case, we can hear the case in front of us. Was that your affordable housing joke? Uh -huh. Was that your affordable housing joke? A million dollars? Didn't you say that about affordable housing if you make a million bucks? Is that you? Yeah. That was good. The parents said, you know, the parents told me definition. Yes, I'll go with with the real affordable housing. Right, right. What are you talking about? 60%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 
We got a whole bunch of people. We do, we do. And I, and I saw the plans for this, and I would love to move in there. But I'm going to need you to, to need you sponsor me. Right just now. So you write me, you write me a big check. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, it's one of those. I think it's good for Durham. I think it's good. We need to have. We need to have that. We need to have we need all. Hi, John. All kinds of things. Because because place it, for, yeah. the money is going to drive something to be able to help those who can't afford. No, I agree. The That's, rising tide floats all boats, right? So, yeah. And I, I can't believe I'm saying that kind of thing because I do like not believe. I'll hold it for you. I can't <laughs> believe either. Well, well, in theory. Uh, I don't think uh, those guys meant it. They're not going to try to help anybody themselves. But you're right. If you if done right, we all should benefit. So it is still going to be an uphill struggle, but I think everybody has the right heart. I know our church is active in this sort of thing. Legislature, uh, all the hurdles to this legislation. Agree. Agree. Great. Areas. Anyway, uh, yeah. 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 Go out and kick the tire. There you go. Various things. You never heard so. of it. Yeah, I have. <laughs> That's one reason why I asked them. It's because, it's because they have been thrown curveball after curveball after curveball after curveball. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, I know. It's not a. I don't think it's a joke. You know, one thing that happened is that they did, you know, they, they have changed the route times and we had a meeting. I was impressed to see that they changed the route to go to NCCU after a lot of people. So you know we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Hey, we, should, we should get a beer sometime. We should. I hope we get you out of here relatively soon. It's gonna be yeah, I was gonna I was gonna talk to Cedric too because I I was like in that last meeting I felt there you go. Like, okay I think I have a blowout. I have a blowout with these guys. Yeah, I think, I think we can agree on a lot of stuff. It's a good group here. Yeah, it's actually good. He's going to have to recuse himself. Yeah. So what I've done, I've opened up your podium. Oh, fantastic. Just put it there and there. Right. So in the interest of time, we're going to get started again. If if you are planning to depart the Planning Commission meeting, if you are still having conversations, please, we urge you to go into the lobby so we can hear the case in front of us. <laughs> Once we have a quorum of commissioners, we will get started again. Our next case is a comprehensive plan future land use map amendment with the concurrent zoning map change. So these are cases A18 quadruple zero three and Z18 quadruple zero six. This is for the rail operations maintenance facility or the ROMF. And before we begin, I recognize Commissioner Baker. Yeah, I'd like to request to uh, recuse myself from this item. Is there a reason? And Commissioner Baker, do you, do you mind sharing the, the reason your request for a recusal? Yes, I'm involved in the application process. Thank you very much. We have a motion for a recusal of Commissioner Baker from this particular case. Mr. Chairman, I move that we disqualify Commission Member Baker from consideration of cases A18 quadruple zero three and uh, Z18 quadruple zero six. We have a second. Second, second Commissioner Alturk. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. So we will we'll begin with the staff report. Again, if we know a lot of folks have signed up for this case. If you have not yet had a chance to sign up, the table on our left, on your right, please sign up. Give us your name, your address, and if you can list if you are for, speaking for or against. And we will have the, the, the folks speaking for will speak first in public hearings, and then those against will speak second. Each side will have 10 minutes. Uh, in this case, I, I've heard we have a lot of folks signed up, so we will deliberate and look to extend the public hearing time. So each of you have a fair amount of time, and each side will have an equal amount of time available. 
Ms. Sonyak? Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number A180003, Z180006, the Rail Operations Maintenance Facility, also referred to as the ROM. The applicant is Go Triangle. The address is uh, generally located at 4901 Farrington Road on the east side of Farrington. The um, subject site is um, pending annexation. Uh, the site is 23.418 acres. The rezoning request is um, residential suburban 20 and uh, uh, I'm sorry, residential suburban 20 to industrial light with a development plan. The property is currently designated to commercial and office um, in the future land use map designation and the applicant is proposing an amendment to industrial to coincide with the rezoning request. The proposal is to allow the rail operations and maintenance facility um, for the overall Durham Orange light rail project. Uh, the site has a pending annexation petition and on receipt of a recommendation from the Planning Commission, um, that would be consolidated with the items um, and the City Council would hear the request at that time. This is the aerial map and the subject site is shown in red, is located within the suburban tier and within the Neuse River Basin. Um, as mentioned, it's on the east side of Farrington Road across from Ephesus Church Road and adjacent to I-40. This is the existing conditions sheet of the development plan. There are 12 parcels um, comprising of the site ranging in size between um, about a half an acre to seven, over seven acres in size. Most of the site is vacant, undeveloped land and um, includes pine and hardwood forests. However, there are a number of existing um, single family homes. There's an existing telecommunications tower that will remain on site. There are several riparian corridors and isolated wetlands areas. There are existing drainage, sewer, and utility easements, um, as well as a access easement to get to the existing wireless communications facility. Uh, a portion of right-of-way, which is Dabney Road, runs through the site, which would need to be closed or withdrawn prior to um, site plan approval. And these um, photos, which are included in the staff report, uh, depict some of the um, existing conditions in the properties. Uh, in terms of the area, the site is adjacent to the Patterson Mills Country Store to the south, the village at Cope Harbor Residential Development to the west, and I-40 to the east. Um, there are several nearby residential developments. Um, the Glenview Park, Prescott Place are located to the northeast of the site across, um, across I-40. Amada Vale, Creekside, and Weston Downs residential developments, um, as well as the Creekside Elementary School are located to the west um, off of Ephesus Church, less than a half a mile away. Well, this map shows the existing and proposed zoning um, as shown on left. The property is currently zoned residential suburban 20 within the Falls Jordan District watershed protection overlay and the major transportation corridor overlay of I-40. On the right, the property is shown um, in purple with the change to industrial light uh, with a development plan to accommodate for the ROMP facility. This is the future land use map as shown on the left. The property is designated commercial and office on the future land use map. And um, they're proposing to change it to purple on the right, which is industrial. This is the development plan, which shows um, site access points, the building and parking envelope, uh, stream buffers, project boundary buffers, the existing and proposed easements, um, the tree coverage areas and a maximum building height of 50 feet. The applicant is seeking to utilize the Falls Jordan District overlay um, a high density option and has committed to a maximum impervious coverage 
of 60%. Through the development plan, the applicant is also seeking approval of an encroachment into the MTC buffer for tracks, uh, light rail access, and the relocation of some easements. The, um, this slide just summarizes some of the graphic commitments that were just shown. Uh, in addition, the applicant has committed to a variety of building materials um, and sloped or flat roofs. In terms of key commitments shown on the development plan, the applicant has committed to development limited to the ROMP facility and the existing wireless communications facility. Vehicle body repair and paint shops are prohibited. Um, there is an added uh, vegetative screen along the um, Farrington Road frontage. Uh, buildings will be placed a minimum of 75 feet and parking at least 30 feet from Farrington Road. Um, there would be uh, a text commit, there is a text commitment where lighting would be aimed away from the project, project boundaries. Also, prior to site clearing, the applicant will obtain all required permits and um, from all parties relative to impacts on wetlands, riparian areas, and no-build buffers. This slide um, highlights some of the key transportation improvements uh, along Farrington Road in terms of um, constructing the southbound left turn lane, constructing the site access easements, um, revising uh, pavement markings on Ephesus Church Road uh, and modifying the existing traffic signal to accommodate the site. This, this uh, slide highlights um, some of the plans that the application um, is consistent with. And in terms of um, in terms of consistency with the comprehensive plan, the property is currently designated as commercial and office on the future land use map, um, which is not consistent with the proposed industrial light zoning. Uh, as a result, the applicant has proposed to change the land use designation to, um, to industrial to coincide. So in terms of the future land use map, the application is consistent with policy 2131 the applicant has voluntarily, voluntarily offered restrictions on the use of property. Um, the, in addition, the industrial zoning designation will help support new jobs, employment centers, uh, and access to non-vehicular transportation once the project is complete. Consistent with 222B, <laughs> the site is located within the suburban tier, and the development plan includes a number of committed proffers to help support the transition between the adjacent low, medium, and medium density residential future land use designations um, and the proposed industrial designation. The proposed industrial land use designation is consistent with policy 242C as the development plan provides access to Farrington Road in line with the intersection of Ephesus Church Road. In terms of the zoning map designation, uh, it is consistent with policy 231A. While the industrial land use deviates from the existing residential development patterns of the surrounding area, the development plan includes a number of prof committed proffers to help support transitions between the residential developments and the proposed rail operations maintenance facility. The site is um, also large enough in size to support the proposed use and provide for enhanced buffering along the east frontage along Farrington Road and to the south. They are consistent with 232A and 812H. The applicant has proffered various roadway and transportation improvements to help address the added traffic associated with this application. They are consistent with 234C. The uh, subject site is buffered appropriately on the development plan associated with the zone map change request. The applicant has committed to additional vegetative screening along the property's frontage. The proposed development is consistent with policy 814D, since additional asphalt will be provided along the full frontage of the northern side um, for future bike lane. Uh, the applicant has proffered a number of 
um, roadway improvements relative to address the existing conditions along Farrington Road. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the Durham Chapel Hill uh, 2035 um, Long Range Transportation Plan, the 2040 Metropolitan Transportation Plan, the Durham County Bus Rail Investment Plan, the updated Durham County Transportation Plan, the Durham Orange Light Rail Transit Corridor Plan, and a majority of the applicable policies in the Durham Comprehensive Plan and the Unified Development Ordinance. I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. We will move to the public hearing first, and I assume we will likely have some questions when we close the public hearing and we hear from the commissioners. If you just give us a moment, they're going to bring over the sign-up sheet. And just to remind everyone, again, we will start with those who have signed up to speak for the proposal and then those who have signed up to speak against. That, that means I'm out of time. We have, <laughs> you are not, however, we have over 30 individuals who have signed up to speak. We have 12 individuals who have signed up to speak for. And 25 who have signed up to speak against. Uh, there are some names who have been crossed out as well, so we will do our best. We will have, everyone will have the opportunity to speak if they would so like to speak. Uh, I would recommend, but I'm open to suggestions, that again, we give each individual two minutes to be able to speak. I know everyone has come out. That's going to be a long hearing, but I think it's an important issue, and all of you have come out this evening. Fellow commissioners, what do you say? One motion. I, I would accept a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that we give every, spe it, uh, every speaker tonight at least two minutes. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So we will work through the 12 individuals who have signed up to speak. Uh, I don't know if the proponents had someone in mind that they wanted to have speak first, and if not, I'm just going to go down the list. Is there someone who would like to speak first? Mr. Talmadge? Again, to remind folks as well, and this is what was happening in one of the earlier cases, Everyone who signed up to speak now has two minutes to speak. The, the clock will tick off the two minutes. You'll hear the beeping when your two minutes is finished. You, if someone wants to give up their two minutes of time, they are welcome to do so. They can give their time to another speaker. That's what you saw in one of the earlier cases. So just so everyone knows. But I will read off every, every name. Everyone can choose to have their two minutes to speak if they signed up. So go ahead, Mr. Thomas. Good evening, I'm John Talmadge, uh, the interim project director for the light rail transit project. I'm a Durham resident and happy to celebrate my birthday with you all tonight. <laughs> Shall we sing? Uh, you get three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday. Uh, Go Triangle is a regional public transportation agency it's created by the General Assembly of North Carolina in 1989 and has been providing public transportation service uh, since uh, the early 1990s. Uh, our mission is to improve our region's quality of life by connecting people and places through reliable and easy to use travel choices. The light rail project has been, uh, in this corridor, has been more than 20 years in planning and development. And it will serve critical connections between the residents and visitors in our region and uh, the three major universities, the, univer the uh, hospitals at UNC, Duke, and the VA Medical Center, connecting people to three of the top ten employers in the state, creating tens of thousands of new jobs and infusing billions of dollars into our local economy. This project is nearly 18 miles long uh, with a proposed 19 stations connecting from UNC hospitals in the west to North Carolina Central University in the east, the large green uh, dot in the 
left center of this is the proposed location for the uh, rail operations and maintenance facility. That's the property that was identified through an extensive environmental impact uh, study. We looked at 20 sites during a scoping process, five during the draft environmental impact statement, and this site was selected at that time as having the uh, lowest environmental and community impacts of, of the five sites. Mr. Green. I'd like to defer my time uh, back to Mr. Talmadge and also to Mr. Walden. I'm sorry, and, and, and could you speak into the microphone? I'd actually like to defer my time to Roger Walden, who signed up after me. Okay. So, Mr. Walden, you, are, you may come up and speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good evening to the uh, Planning Commission. I'm Roger Walden. I'm a planner. I've been a planner for a long time, and I'm a, uh, a member of the development team that Go Triangle has assembled. There are some other members of the team uh, here that might be helpful in answering questions tonight. Uh, we have architects, landscape architects, planners, environmental engineers, civil engineers who have all been contributing uh, and working on this project. So uh, that's where we are. And uh, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna talk for just a few minutes about the applications and then we'll sit down and all of us are here available to answer questions if you'd like. Um, so the, uh, uh, the staff gave a, a very good and complete uh, uh, presentation to you, so I'm not going to uh, repeat a lot of those things that were said. This package of, uh, of applications supports the use of this site for a, uh, a maintenance facility, uh, as we have talked about, and we're requesting the uh, amendment to the land use plan and then along with the rezoning. <clears throat> Staff mentioned the outreach, and uh, there's been other discussion about that. There's been extensive outreach over, over the period of planning for this project, and particularly in the last three years is what I'd like to, uh, to highlight here. The, uh, I've had many, many events to encourage people to come out and get information about the light rail project and offer their comments and suggestions. Uh, this is just this slide is just a uh, summary of some of those meetings over the last couple of years, both along the full scope of the of the rail, but then also focusing on uh, the site specific the Farrington Road project. We've heard a lot of comments, and one of the things that came out of that those comments were concerns about traffic. So we try to incorporate a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the comments into our plans and make adjustments. And this is one example of. Uh, people were concerned about traffic. Uh, the, this project, the rezoning, would not require preparation of a transportation uh, impact analysis, uh, but Go Triangle chose to do that anyway because it, it has been a concern. And the, uh, one of the things that uh, came out of the transportation impact analysis was that the, uh, the number of trips, car trips per day from this site to and from is likely to be considerably less than would be uh, expected under current zoning, probably about half of what would be expected under current zoning, and also that the development with its improvements that are proposed uh, would result in a level of service at peak hours that is the same as it is today, so no change. And we're, we're pleased to be able to report that. Uh, staff has already talked about some of the commitments that we were uh, have in the project in terms of uh, dedicated lanes and widening Farrington Road to allow a bicycle path. We've also uh, heard from the staff about the major transportation corridor, that's another thing I wanted to emphasize, uh, that is uh, along the east side of the property, uh, uh, boundary with the I-40 right of way, there are several uh, existing uh, uh, pieces of land disturbance in that buffer right now uh, with the water and sewer easements, and two more will be uh, coming with the uh, tracks going into the site through the buffer and coming back out. Uh, we've, I've, as you've heard, we've made uh, commitments to mitigate those buffer impacts to the greatest extent possible. The other commitments, staff has gone over those. I just wanted to highlight the first one, the, uh, that the site can only be used for a rail maintenance facility if this rezoning is approved. So uh, we're, we're, we're committing to that, that that's all that would happen, plus the additional commitments that you've heard. Uh, we believe that this proposal is consistent with the uh, comprehensive plan and we have seen support from both Durham City and Durham County for this light rail project. And in conclusion, 
we are asking for your recommendation to approve these applications. Thank you. Thank you very much. Van Katati. Good evening, commissioners, and thank you for your service. Um, my name is Diane Katati. I used to live on Ephesus Church Road. I live in southwest Durham off of old Chapel Hill Road and know this area well. I strongly support the light rail project, and I encourage you all to um, support this land use change and rezoning. I served on the Durham City Council from 2003 to 2015, during which time we reviewed and visited the rail operations maintenance facility proposed locations. I believe this proposed location is the most appropriate location for the romp. I also have visited the Charlotte romp, uh, which is surrounded by residential apartment buildings, and it is surprisingly quiet outside. This is a large site at roughly 23 acres and allows for buffering and mitigation um, efforts to address neighborhood concerns. The rezoning development plan also includes, as you know, additional com committed elements, including shielded lighting and additional vegetative screening that I believe also help to address neighborhood concerns. The romp, as you've heard, will generate less traffic than other land uses that could be developed under the existing zoning. So again, I urge you to vote to support the land use change and rezoning this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Dick Hales. And then we have Dan Jewell and Ed Harrison, just so we can get everyone ready. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. My name is Dick Hales. I live at 100 Briarcliff Road in Durham. I'm a professional planner with 35 years work experience in Durham, Greensboro, and as a consultant around the state. I'm making comments tonight on behalf of the coordinating committee of the Coalition on Affordable Housing and Transit, a community group with 300 plus participants dedicated to promoting mixed income communities with strong transit access for all citizens in Durham, particularly around light rail transit stations. The staff report for this request lists uh, many severe limitations and commitments. You heard Mr. Um, uh, Walden speak about that. We believe the proposed use of this site as requested is compatible with surrounding properties. The request would only permit a transit service facility located on a fairly large site next to a busy interstate highway with a main building having substantial setbacks and buffers and with internally focused lighting. Existing buildings and zoning in the area have or allow similar buffers and setbacks to what's proposed and to be absolutely clear, no other industrial or non-residential uses of any kind would ever be permitted on this site with the proposed zoning. Specific impacts of the proposed development would also be compatible and less than that currently allowed by existing zoning on the site. For example, you could theoretically build 51 single family residential units on this site with the current zoning. These lesser impacts include less traffic, less school impacts, less water usage, uh, would encourage larger setbacks, would have similar building heights and landscape buffers to what's found in the surrounding area, significant on-site stormwater detention, and very little noise added to the already significant I-40 highway noise. Is that two minutes? Okay. Um, and finally, I'd just like to ask all persons who are present in support of this case to please stand at this time. Great, thank you. Thank you. Dan Jewell. Good evening, commissioners. I am Dan Jewell. Uh, I reside at 1025 Gloria Avenue. I'm a licensed landscape architect. I've been practicing here in, here in Durham for 33 years now. Usually I'm here before you representing a, a developer as an applicant for a, a zoning case, but tonight I'm here as a private citizen uh, asking you to support this request. I have much familiarity with this neighborhood. Um, among the, the hundreds of site plans and dozens of zonings that I've been involved with over those many years, um, I've done several in this area. We did the site plan and uh, uh, use permits for Creekside Elementary School. Uh, we did the rezoning for the villas at Culp Arbor and have been working with many of the folks in this neighborhood for more than 15 years now 
uh, helping with community meetings, organizing design charrettes, and doing ongoing land planning to help this neighborhood get ready for the long planned transit corridor. And I do mean long planned. I've reviewed the de proposed development plan and the text commitments included. By my analysis, it meets or exceeds the UDO requirements for landscape buffering, tree coverage, uh, and they are committing to building setbacks that are almost double what the UDO requires for the requested zoning. I know the plan will have some impacts on streams and wetlands, but I've closely followed for years the efforts to look for a site and hone them down, and every site had challenges, including environmental and neighborhood impacts. <clears throat> this site, though, does make the most sense from an operational standpoint, and in my opinion, has no more impacts than the other sites considered. Once every generation, we need to make a difficult decision for the sake of the future of our community. The request before you tonight, I know, may not be popular to some people, but it is the right thing to do for our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. Ed Harrison. Uh, this is the earliest I've ever been a speaker list in this room for a land use hearing, if you catch my drift. Um, uh, I live at 58 Newton Drive, uh, Durham 27707. That is right at three quarters of a mile from the proposed entry drive for this project. Uh, I've lived there for more than 28 years. That many years going through this corner of Farrington and Ephesus Church to Raleigh and beyond and a lot of places in between. Um, thousands upon thousands of times, I have been a student of Farrington and Ephesus Church Roads as much as anybody in the world for all those years. Um, spent 16 years on the Metropolitan Planning Organization Board of Directors, that's the transportation planning body for the region. I was there as a Chapel Hill Council member, and I was there and everywhere else very defensive about Ephesus Church Road in particular because it's, a, it's how a lot of my friends and for many years constituents got to the rest of the world going east. And so for me, traffic here, traffic is and should be a major concern with any proposal on Farrington Road, particularly at this corner. And the, uh, just to note early on in the staff report, you're advised that the future land use designation for this property is commercial and office. And I interviewed uh, actually transportation staff about the implications for that some months ago. Um, and that basically means a strip mall, literally a narrow strip, and medical office. And those are two really high traffic generators. So any use is probably less traffic generating than those. But as others have pointed out, the really striking thing is, is that this proposed use clearly and upzoning produces a major decrease in projected traffic, 46%, even if it's 23%. Having voted on a whole lot of rezonings, actually hold the record probably for Chapel Hill, I'd say you, it's a rare opportunity, if ever, you will get to vote for something that actually lowers traffic. Can I have a minute on a bike bed facility at all? Um, unless okay. someone uh, give, gives up their time. Okay, it'll take 30 seconds, but it's all right. Well, yeah. we, we need to wrap up, Mr. Okay. Harrison. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sibinoman? And I, I know I got that wrong. You know, it's okay. I, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, you commissioners, for giving me the opportunity to speak. And really, I'm a professor at NCCU, and so can you imagine my students trying to get my name right? It's amazing. I'm, I'm just, I'm Dr. Professor VJ, and that's how it goes. It's fine. Um, so as a faculty, as, a, as, as someone who's fortunate to be a professor at NCCU, which I'm very proud of, um, I'm also a resident in Carborough, so I apologize for being an interloper here. But uh, that being said, I'm on both ends of this transit rail, and it's something that I'm actually very, very in support of. And because another hat I, I, I sit with is actually serving on the Affordable Housing Board in Carborough. And so affordable housing is a big deal for me. Giving access to people is a big deal to me. Transportation is a big deal to me. And for all of these reasons, this specific, this light rail has been, has been vetted and vetted and vetted to provide all of these things to our community. I mean, there's gotta be some control around it, but I really do believe this gains access, it gives affordable housing options to people to work all across this corridor, which I think is becoming a dire, more and more dire situation. So 
I also see a value to the students of our community. So I serve on a, a U54 shared grant between UNC and NCCU where students from both institutions do research at the other institution. So I'm bringing UNC students to NCCU and vice versa. However, it is incredibly challenging to get students from point A to point B or to attend a seminar at any of these institutions. Um, as it is, I mean, I can get people to go to Duke, but I can't park at Duke, so it's ridiculous. But I can, we have a, we have a light rail option. That's amazing because that'll give access for our students who don't even go into downtown Durham an ability to get to Durham, you know? Uh, our students' ability to get to Chapel Hill, to get around this area, which is a very, very big deal. So for all these reasons, I really, really support this. I feel like this station has demonstrated all these values. I mean, it's a budding 40. It's a great situation, really. It, it seems that of all situations, it's a good op opportunity. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. Sue Hunter. Hi, my name is Sue Hunter, and I'm here tonight to speak to you as a member of an Orange and Durham County working group that supports the light rail. I'm also a former resident of Durham County and Eastwood Park, which is just around the corner from this facility. And I've been coming to meetings like this for more than 10 years to support this project, and I wanted to come out again tonight. Um, I voted for the transit tax in 2011. I have a go pass that I use to commute to work. In 2013, I moved over the county line to Orange County, and I commute from there to the largest employer in your county, Duke University. And that's what this project is really about. And this maintenance facility is really key to having this project work. So I respectfully ask that you approve the zoning request. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker signed up to speak for is Isaac Woods. Thank you, commissioners. <laughs> I, I signed up for because this is a, a bad light rail project. It's just not at the stage of where we need to move forward. And I say that for three reasons. I reached out to Rob Baker, John Erickson, all go triangle. My family reside and the property has already been taken to intimate domain where the light road goes. It's seven acres altogether. We own another 25 acres that's right across the street, Everton Church Road, Grant Road intersection. But I was impressed with the last hearing because the developer reached out to the neighbors and, and listened to them and said, well, what do you want us to do? This hasn't happened. We, we worked for years. This has been our family since the end of slavery to get the infrastructure there, the water, is the, the sewer easement that they, you keep hearing them talk about, that's for the whole family that they're abandoning us on. I said, well, what are you going to do about the easement and the sewer? No answers from Rob Baker. No answers from No Go Triangle. We have attended every meeting that they had. But at this time, until they can be responsive to the adjacent neighbors on how they're going to protect that sewer easement and provide sewer service for us that we worked for years to get, even before they had Creekside School, this isn't ready. I asked the planning department, let me see some drawings of plans. How are you going to do with the infrastructure there? The sewer easement, no response. The next issue is the noise. We stay there. We work to get this property that's zoned commercial. That's in my family, all right? We worked when they brought 40 through to have that property zoned commercial because of the noise in the state 40. No input on how are you going to reduce the amount of noise with these trains locking up and taking off. No response. Everybody know that the trains make noise. Also, in regards to, they say, well, what type of maintenance are you going to do there? They say no hazardous chemicals. What prevents them from coming in later and saying, well, we're going to do some other type of industrial division or some type of other maintenance facility? At this time, I ask that, the, that you send this back for more public hearings because this light rail, this location did not come up at the initial hearings. It only came up at the end. And I ask that you send this back and have more community meetings for more input from the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, B.R. Hoffman, that was probably a good transition to those opposed to this proposal. <laughs> so B.R. Hoffman and then uh, Ruth McKinney. Again, two minutes per person. Thank you. My name is B.R. Hoffman. I live at 211 Penal Court with an address of Chapel Hill, but I live in Durham. Um, we live in the villas of Culp Arbor. We moved here just a year ago, and it's a wonderful community. And if you drive down Farrington, 
you will see lovely homes, greenery, trees, a wonderful place to live. I am not against the light rail. I think it's a great idea, but I am not for rezoning this for the maintenance facility. We don't need more traffic on Farrington Road. Um, there is another development right across from the school uh, of like 650 townhouses. We have 600 apartments built at the end of Farrington Road. So that, that is all going to contribute. But is this not a 24-7 facility? And so how does that fit in a re residential community? I don't get it. So I, I appreciate the board. I served on a planning board in Banner Elk for five years. I know how important your job is to see both sides. But I ask you to vote against this rezoning. Thank you. Uh, Ruth McKinney, and I'm going to read off a few more names. Again, I apologize. I'm going to get some of these wrong. But you, you can come on up. But just so you can line up in the interest of time, David Cachetto, Lisa Brock, John Von Acker, and Angela Grillo. Thank you. Um, good evening, commissioners, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for letting us speak and bring our positions forward tonight. I don't want to talk about the pros and cons of the light rail. I'm just looking at the zoning issue uh, with my comments. I live at 51, I'm a new resident at 5139 Niagara Drive. I've lived in the area of this project for almost 50 years. I bought my first house in 1977 off of Ephesus Church Road, and I have now bought my retirement home at Culp Arbor because I like that area. My first job was as a school counselor at Githens Middle School when it was a junior high school and attached to Jordan, which those of you under the age of 40 can't even remember. Um, I'm concerned, let me first compliment the staff that you're in your presentation tonight and in the consolidated report. I thought you did an excellent job of representing the residential neighbor, nature of the neighborhood and showing the area with the Creekside Elementary School. What you can't get from the slides and from that report is how quiet it is out there. It's beautiful and peaceful. It, you can take walks at night, you can take walks early in the morning. It's a peaceful, lovely area. The, the major traffic is when parents are taking their children to school and home. Um, my concern is threefold about the remainder of the report, which I think had some omissions. Um, I don't agree with the conclusion that the planning uh, criteria have been met. Um, my first concern echoes the concerns of the gentleman who spoke. Um, I think it's gonna be a very noisy project. Um, my second concern, and, and there was nothing in the report that addressed noise, nothing. I read it over and over today after it was posted online. Second, um, I'm concerned about the 24-7 potential for servicing that area. My understanding, again, from talking to neighbors, is that there will be repairs done at night, there will be repairs done on weekends. Those are times when we're sleeping, those are times when we're relaxing, that's the time when children are doing homework. And it's not appropriate in a residential area. Thank you. I didn't get to my third point, but thank you for letting me speak. Great, thank you very much. David Cachetto. We appreciate all of you staying within the two minute limit. You can imagine if we added one additional minute, that would be with 37 speakers, that would be a lot of math to have to do sitting up here. So we're trying to keep it focused. You may go ahead, sir. Understood, good evening. Uh, my name is David Coquetto. I own a home at 5146. Niagara Drive and the villas at Culp Harbor. Uh, as you know, a residential development adjacent to the property proposed for rezoning. 108 of my neighbors and I signed a petition opposing this change in zoning. Uh, that petition was submitted to members of this commission uh, yesterday. We oppose this rezoning for several reasons, including the incompatibility between an industrial facility and our residential area, the burdens of increased noise and light particularly at night on our residential area, and apparent elimination of the greenway that was previously included in Durham's master plan. We oppose this proposed change in uh, zoning. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Lisa Brock. Does this start when I say my name, or does it start when I start talking? <laughs> 
<laughs> I never watched the clock closely enough to actually know. Let's hope I can at least get my address in before you start timing me down here. My name is Lisa Brock, B-R-A-C-H. I like the candies. No, I'm not related. Yes, I wish I were. Um, my address is 5233 Niagara Drive in the village of Culp Harbor. And you've already started me, and I asked about that. So I'm going to say my piece. It made sense 10 years ago when Durham Planning Commission sought a developer whose market was 55 and over who built the villas of Culp Arbor on Parrington Road. After all, Creekside Elementary had already outgrown its capacity, so having a development where 90% of the owners had to be 55 or over <clears throat> was a good plan, um, past, being past their childbearing years. Um, Placing a community of retirees along Farrington Road also made sense as you tried to control the traffic congestion, which was already at a maximum capacity, particular at rush, particularly at rush hour times of day. It made sense to develop unused pasture land into homes, which brought higher tax revenues to the city of Durham. Our neighborhood quickly filled with retirees from all over the U.S., Michigan, New York, Florida, Tennessee, Californians were lured to our neighborhood, which is now 500 to 1,000 feet away from the properties to be zoned. The other middle-income neighborhoods which can be affected by this rezoning include Glenview Park, Prescott Place, the Enclave, Weston Downs, and Morena Place, to name just a few. What does not make sense is making a zoning recommendation which will restore, res destroy the very neighborhoods you have managed to create. The federal funding for the project for this site is not secured and looking less likely every day. What happens if there is no federal funding and you have already rezoned residential suburban land to industrial or industrial light? This kind of zoning is drastic. It's spot zoning. It's against the UDO guidelines. And ma'am, I'm going to have to stop you there unless someone is willing to give you their time in the interest of fair. Oh, you just got to, and, and madam, what is your name? Thank you. Uh, what is your name? Grillo. Grillo, thank you. This kind of zoning is drastic and cannot, and probably cannot be undone. Um, it's spot zoning. It's also known as leapfrog zoning, and it's against UDO guidelines unless you've managed to change those lately. With the closest industrial zone nearly 10 miles away, it is typical of spot zoning. I plead with you. My neighbors wearing these badges, raise your hands, plead with you to err on the side of caution rather than crush a decision, then rush a decision. <laughs> very nervous, rush a decision which has the potential to negatively affect the health, safety, and quality of our neighborhoods and our lives. Please do not recommend the rezoning of these properties. Do not place us at risk for the what-ifs that can be placed on an industrial zoned property. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Brock and Ms. Grillo for sharing your time. Do you want the last minute? Take me that long. My name is John Von Aiken, and I call home 5203 Niagara Drive. It's in Culp Harbor. My biggest concern is I appreciate all those people who are out there trying to put this light rail together. I'm not arguing it's something that's necessary. So the commission, the committee, everybody who has to do something about it has to get involved. The only problem I'm having is that how many of those people, especially those that came here tonight to get it approved, live in the area that will be affected. It's easy to say it's okay to build something as long as it's not my backyard, but when it is and the people that are here show up, people get excited. Yeah, because of the additional noise factor that'll be on Farrington Road throughout the day and night, the extra trucks that'll be on that road, the extra traffic, let alone the fact that as she was trying to mention earlier about the government funding, if this does not go through, what will you do with the property? Will you revert it back to residential? Or will you sell it to some commercial developer who wants to put in a light industrial that it's rated for and start building factories there, which will definitely be anti-local community? These are all things I encourage you to think about before it's too late. 
There might be other solutions as far as where you could put the rail yard. I applaud you for at least looking into it and considering it. And right now, since the other gentleman had the opportunity of saying the people that want this thing turned down, I'd like those who will not have a chance to talk, stand up and saying, I'm against this program. You can just stand up, thank you. <laughs> that, that would violate our rules of procedure. Well, I just wanted to make the effect, since the other people had a chance to show that they had maybe 15 people here, there's a lot more voices to be said, and I'm gonna get off my time right now. I thank the committee, do what you gotta do, but think about it, if your parents were living in that facility, what would you do? Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna read off a few additional names. Carol Bylinski, if you can come up, you're up next, but then we also have Curtis Booker, Phil Post, Ann Von Holly, James Valentine, and many more. But if you can just line up, that'd be great. You may go ahead. Good evening. My name is Carol Bolinski, and I live at 214 Culp Hill Drive in Chapel Hill. Neighborhood. The words come up many times tonight. This is our neighborhood, a retirement community, a school of 918 students and 60 faculty just nearby established communities which have been named tonight. There is absolutely no reason to rezone our neighborhood with light industrial properties, plants, or facilities. The implications of rezoning are not to be minimized. Rezoning this area opens up risks to the rural buffer, small as it is, and to the pastoral setting, which is slowly disappearing. Rezoning is going to impact families, children, and the residents who have chosen and who continue to choose to live here. The current influx of multi-storied and multi-building apartments has already had an impact on the environment, infrastructure, wildlife, safety, and the once bucolic roadway of Farrington Road. Our neighborhood doesn't need immediate access to commercial businesses such as automobile park stores, mattress stores, or strip malls, all of which could be easy all of which are easily accessible now? Or do we need any other commercial or industrial facilities in our neighborhood? We are stewards of our land. We need to care for our environment, protect the wildlife and wetlands, and secure the safety of our Farrington Road and Ephesus neighborhood. I urge you to keep the RS20 properties. And you, the city planners, have managed to create over the, these years a great place. That's why I moved to Culp Arbor. At what cost are you willing to toss this aside? Please do not rezone our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Curtis Booker. I'm not going to be able to give this in two minutes, but um, Chairman Busby, did you give out the, okay, all of you have a copy. I hope you will read it before you vote. Uh, I, my situation is unique. I live at 5117 Farrington Road. I own the full southern boundary of the romp and also until they took it, seven and a half acres of the south side of the romp property. Uh, they took my property in March, deposited money, but they put artificial encumbrances on it. And so now, seven months later, I still do not have a penny of the compensation that I am due. Uh, the, uh, there are many problems that I've had. And if you think back to uh, Dr. Ms. Seaman's property and the neighborhood involvement in that, this has been anything but, as you can see from the document that I've given you. Uh, it's just, I mean, that reads like fiction. You can't believe that those things happened, but they did. Uh, so the ROP is taking my sewer easement and access, which runs all the way from I-40 to Farrington Road through my property and offering nothing so far in terms of how I access sewer. The property at the top of the hill above the uh, rump is on the study list for the National Register and there are screening guidelines for that that have not been met. 
So I ask you to reject Code Triangle's application and recommend that the City Council postpone any action on this request until these issues have been resolved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Booker, and thank you for your written comments as well. Phil Post. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, my name's Phil Post. I live at on St. Andrew's Place in Durham County, and I've been a 40-year resident of this uh, part of Durham County. There's been impressive things said today about uh, light rail, but as you know, that's not the question before you tonight. You've got to make four uh, findings before you can rezone this property. Number one, is this rezoning consistent with land use plans? And I would submit to you, and I believe, that there are no land use plans that indicate there's going to be industrial zoning on the west side of Interstate 40. There's no Durham plan, there's no Chapel Hill plan, there's no Durham County plan that has any indication there was going to be industrial zoning on the west side of Interstate 40. And therefore, those of us who invested in homes and chose schools uh, on the west side of I-40 had no notice whatsoever that there was going to be industrial zoning. In fact, up to this very second, there's no in, uh, land use plan that indicates industrial zoning on the west side of Interstate 40. Is it compatible with the existing land uses? You've heard testimony tonight, and those of you who have visited the site and know that it's surrounded by residential uses and an elementary school know that a 365-day industrial facility that operates 24 hours a day is not compatible with residential and elementary school uses. Will it have substantial adverse impacts? Absolutely, it will have substantial impacts. If we understand the site plans correctly, about 88% of the trees on this site will be removed. In fact, it'll be clear cut from the interstate highway to Farrington Road, every, every stick will be a knockdown. You're gonna cross over streams, wetlands, in order to con construct this site, and you'll replace it back with a 20 foot uh, wide planted buffer, which I would submit to you is completely inadequate. And there's been no comment about uh, how to mitigate those. And is it of an adequate size and shape? If you have to clear cut the site and you have to destroy the MTC buffer and wetlands and stream buffers, then you know for a fact that this site isn't big enough or configured correctly to be a rezone to industrial. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Ann Van Holly. My name is Ann Von Holly, and I have been living in Durham City, Durham County for over 10 years. My address is 1158 Bell Fairway. I want to start by saying that I am not a foe of public transportation. I used to enjoy taking my two children to their preschool in a bike trailer and then taking a bus into work. I am here because my two children are now at Creekside Elementary, and I do not endorse the prospect of an industrial rezoning and its effect on the school, which is around a quarter of a mile away from this site. First, I am concerned that the zoning report does not mention any direct notification of the Creekside Elementary community in excess of 800 students. In talking with parents this past week or two, I get the impression that they have no idea what is being proposed at this site. There is no zoning sign placed at the intersection of Ephesus Church and Farrington Road, the only spot where parents could actually read the information on the sign instead of driving by at 45 miles an hour on the two signs that are up on the property. People at Creekside Elementary need to be informed regarding this issue. Um, congestion is also a major concern. I have been driving on Farrington Road for years to get to Creekside Elementary to take my children there. Why does the zoning report not mention the intersection of 54 and Farrington in their traffic assessment? This is a problem. I can only assume this is where the romp trucks will go to access I-40, along with all the Creekside families heading towards South Point and RTP, neither area to be serviced by light rail, and a rapidly developing residential area servicing the school, 751 South being one example. Finally, does the traffic assessment uh, for this romp include the potential for traffic from the 400 plus housing units on Farrington or Ephesus Church Road soon to be occupied as well as the 190,000 square foot parking garage at the corner of Farrington and 54. If so, the traffic assessment in this report is biased downward than what it could be in the next few years, even prior to breaking ground into site. Thank you. James Valentine. Hi, and thank you. Um, my name is James Valentine. 
the homeowner at 12 Arpeda Way in the Maida Vale neighborhood. So a couple things that have been brought up already, I don't wanna keep hitting on, but the fact that there have been large expansions that, that touch Farrington Road, um, and those expansions we haven't seen the impact of yet is a problem with traffic. On top of that, my understanding is that uh, there was a recent approval to, to reduce the right of way for a possible future expansion of Farrington Road. So I'm kind of confused by some of the comments that have come up that we're looking at reducing traffic by zoning the site industrial um, versus residential. So the impact on the land of using the, um, the light industrial versus the residential, I agree with. But when you take into consideration the removal of the right of way to expand Farrington potentially down the road, it looks like we're creating a giant bottleneck problem. So as others have said, I'm not opposed to light rail. I think that it's, it's great for the community, but I think that there needs to be more study on alternative locations for where this can go. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara Post. And then Denise Hoffman and Kathy Abernathy and I'll keep working on trying to read the next one. Good evening. My name is Barbara Post. I live at 104 St. Andrews Place in Durham County, and I've been a Durham County resident for 40 years. I strongly oppose the rezoning to build the ROMF in my neighborhood because important information is missing from the application. For example, the plan does not show where the tracks will be, nor where the overhead power lines will be located. With regard to the buffers, there, where is the 20-foot wide, 40% uh, opaque buffer? Will there be a 50-foot vegetative buffer to the south? The current application shows a single entrance. Will there be a gate? Where is the emergency access? What if the single entrance is blocked? Will the gate cause traffic to back up from the gate into Farrington Road? There appears to be a mysterious access to the cell tower, as well as a mysterious access to I-40. No detail is shown. No turn lanes are shown. Go Triangle has mentioned a security fence. Where and how high will it be, and what will it look like? A gatehouse has been mentioned, but not shown. On the plans, what is the so-called ancillary structure, which is inside the setback? How many structures will there be? I am a librarian by profession, and I feel confident that you will not be able to make a good decision about rezoning without complete information. It, it is my view that because of the lack of information, the rezoning cannot be approved, and it should not be approved until my questions are answered Thank you for hearing my concerns. Thank you for your time. Denise Hoffman. I don't think that's going to work. Yeah. If, if it's easier, we can have you come around. You don't have to worry about using we can the microphone. The I can try standing. Here, a microphone. We have a microphone coming out. I'm sorry about that. That'll be easier. Here you are. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. I'm sorry. Denise Hoffman, 234 Culp Hill Drive. And like I, many of my fellow speakers here, I thank the commission for letting us have this opportunity to be heard. I also was impressed, as all of you were, with the Pinecrest proposal we heard earlier, down to details like Greenway and architectural considerations, and yet it feels as if there is no consideration for what this is going to do to impact our community in the same way. So we would like to see that more be looked at. What is going to be done to make sure that we have those same kinds of considerations? Thank you. Thank you very much. You can feel free to leave the microphone up there. Next is Kathy Abernathy, and then Linda, and it's me, it's me, not you. I'm, I'm just not reading it right, but yes, that, you're after that. Hello, I argue here for the denial and the deferment of the zoning and the flume proposals. 
It's our right to be here as citizens when it's a rezoning. We've not had, we've had input for the light rail, but this is our opportunity to let you know what the rezoning will impact us. Please do not let the priority and commitment to light rail persuade you to ignore the American Planning Association professional standards against spot zoning. Tonight is the first time I've heard of the pro offers. We live across the street. Why haven't we heard of what they're trying to do to help us adjust to what's across the street? That was what was promised to me when we did not get notices in our mailboxes of major meetings because we were on the wrong computer list. Environmental reasons are the main reason that I oppose primarily this location for the rump. The surrounding land is essentially a wetland and it's freestanding water pools. The Army Corps of Engineers has not has protected the land and has not widened 54 for decades. Lake Jordan is now polluted because I-40 was put in, dense development was south of that, and then Jordan was impounded. That doesn't make sense. We are living with that mistake from years ago. Across the street from this parcel are two non-industrial land uses, residential homes, Creekside School. This romp is a long, long, long way from implementation. What's the hurry? Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, commissioners. Thank you for your time. Um, I voted for the tax. I supported light rail. The uh, romp was dropped on us like a bomb. Um, I, there was a letter writing campaign uh, by children to do away with the, the site near the temple. And light rail used to go down 15501, but somebody, the car dealer said, we don't want it there. And then they went over to Metamont. They said, we don't want light rail there, even though that community was built for that. And so all of a sudden, it's going down the highway. There were a bunch of other sites for the romp. And it was dropped on us like a bomb. I have been in that community for nine years. And one day, we weren't on the list. And the next day, we were the romp. So if we're a little bit upset about it, please understand. I took the bus to work from Duke for four years, and I owned a Prius. <laughs> I have no mileage on it. Um, I support light rail, but not just light rail. I support buses for the whole community. Um, the ramp does not belong in our neighborhood. And in Charlotte, the ramp was built in an industrial area that already had railroad tracks. That's fine. If the people want to go to the romp, they had the choice. But they're putting the romp in our neighborhood of over 55-year-old people, children around the corner, wetlands there. It doesn't belong. And the biggest concern I have, and I was strictly going to talk about the romp, but I've had to change my text several times because people wanted to say light rail to you. And I realize your decision is to improve or disapprove the ROMPS location. But I fear if they build the ROMP and they don't get the funding, they will use it as an excuse to push ahead anyway and put the burden on Durham County taxpayers. And if you don't mind, can you just give us your name and address just for the oh, record I'm as so well? Sorry. No, that's fine. I'm passionate. Uh, Linda Spallone, S-P is in Peter, A-L-L-O-N-E, 5223, 5223 Niagara Drive. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to mess up a few more names, so stick with me. Uh, Thomas Stale, Sherry Herdman, Mary Jean Ferris, Jennifer Hernandez, and Tamara Finn. Tom Stark, did I mess your name up? My apologies. Tom Stark, please come up. Hi, I'm Tom Stark. I live at 105 Conway Drive in Southern Durham County. 
uh, but it says Chapel Hill. Postman doesn't cross the interstate, I guess. I represent uh, Cole Harbor and um, the Oaks Three, uh, two neighborhoods that are very concerned about this facility. This is uh, 23.4 acres that's currently zoned R20. The report acknowledges that the proposal is not consistent with any of the plans. They're asking you to modify the plans. There's a historical uh, Patterson Mill next door. We have all these neighborhoods around. It's a quiet area. It tells us that our MTC buffers are working, that it's a quiet area. But we're talking about cutting a hole in the MTC buffer. We're also talking about putting in a facility that will make at least as much noise as the highway, or so the report says. But for those of us that have lived near a rail yard or a light rail, or have used a light rail regularly, we know that those steel wheels moving through tight curves make a lot of noise. We've talked in this plan about putting lights in and talk generally about focusing them, but there's no empirical, there's no way to test whether or not that criteria is met. The fact of the matter is that this becomes part of your, your transportation corridor. It needs a 100-foot buffer minimum on the outside. We spent a lot of time in our zoning ordinance talking about how to make the vegetative buffers dense enough to work. The buffers that are suggested for this site don't even address sound and are clearly inadequate. This site is not big enough to put an adequate buffer and locate the site. At the other end of the line, there is room next to rail yards, and there's a, a, a rail yard just down from um, the turn in the rail line at the east end. And we're gonna, I'm gonna have to stop you there unless someone's willing to give their time. And, and, great, thank you. You may proceed. It, you have industrial areas. Sound is heard in context. Sharp, squeaky sounds, and remember that this facility is gonna do most of its work from 11 at night till five in the morning. So through the night, you have these lights going and the noise going. When you're in an industrial area, you hear that in context and it blends in. When you're in the country or in a residential area, it's noisy. You've opened up the hole to the highway. You hear the tire noise, all of those sounds grow. And then you hear these high pitched sounds of a working facility an industrial complex. You need to put industrial sites with other industrial, not in residential areas. I know there are a lot of other sites that were looked at along 15501. Uh, 15501 as it turns north around Duke and also uh, on the east end along railroad lines or even right along Main Street. There's, there's some room between the track as a grade separation between Pettigrew and the track. There are places that you can design this thing to work where you don't impose it on a residential community, where you disrupt all. So um, my clients would like to see you uh, recommend denial of this proposal and ask that they place it in a more appropriate location. Remember, not against the rail line, just against this facility in this location. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stark. We, uh, we have Sherry Herdman and Jennifer Hernandez and Tamara Finn, and then we are rounding into the home stretch with just a few more after that. Hi, um, thank you, Durham Planning Commissioners. Um, I'm, my name is Sherry Herdman. I'm president of the Oaks Tree neighborhood. I'm a resident of Durham County. I have been um, for 14 years, and I have been a resident as well as the city of Durham. I don't envy you in your spot tonight because as you've heard, um, this is really going to make a big change to a lot of people. And truthfully, um, you heard Go Triangle say there were all these meetings and all this congeniality. But I think if you sent out a survey and told people really what was going to happen, I think you'd find that I'm really, realistically, I'm thinking you're going to find 98 out of 100 are opposed to this. Uh, change in the zoning. That's what they're opposed to because it's just going to change their way of life. Um, you look at Creekside Elementary. It's the largest elementary school in Durham. 
it has all these neighborhoods that are surrounding it that have just been put in there in the last you know, five, seven years. The moms walk their kids to school. The other moms and dads are driving their kids. So there is huge traffic already around the school, uh, particularly at rush hour. Um, the other thing that was really in the <laughs> final uh, presentation was, oh, by the way, there's no light rail to the light rail maintenance. So nobody mentioned that, but we have a light rail maintenance facility, but you can't get there by light rail, so all the employees have to take cars. Then you have all these trucks. You're going to have things coming from all over the country in trains, then they're going to be loaded onto trucks, then they're going to be driven on these very, you know, not very well-traveled two-lane roads. They're all two-lane. Um, and uh, there's only one small section where they're going four lane on Farrington Road. So you're going to have a lot of traffic issues with toxic chemicals, dangerous materials. And um, this is where the, the people are walking. So, okay. Great. Thank you. Jennifer Hernandez. Hi, I'm Jennifer Hernandez. I live in the Trenton community, which is one I don't think has been mentioned yet tonight. It's on. Trenton and Farrington. Um, so we all have to take Farrington in and out of our neighborhood. Um, I personally work in Raleigh, 30 miles away. Um, so I'm no stranger to being in the car and driving. Um, and traffic is one of my main concerns. Um, I probably should preface all this with, with I hate public speaking and I'm not very good at it. So it tells you a lot that I feel so strongly to come here uh, and, and, and talk about this tonight. You know, I have a lot of concerns around the traffic impact, and I was very disappointed to hear, um, you know, that the impact that this site will have for future expansion, not only, you know, from a two to four lane, as we've talked about, but even bike path or a sidewalk. I have neighbors that ride their bikes with their kids to restaurants or to the elementary school in the community, other neighbors who walk, um, and there isn't even a sidewalk to speak of, uh, much less you know, me who's sitting in traffic for 20 minutes just to get on to 40 to then start the rest of my commute, um, especially around, you know, the school hours of, of Creekside. And that is not even taking into account the impact of future developments that are going up now. So um, I think a, a lot's already been said about how this doesn't make sense in a residential area. Um, and a lot's been said around, you know, the traffic. I don't know that a lot's been said around the greenway impact, pe pedestrian, bicycles. Um, and I think Sherry just touched on, you know, it is ironic that it is a light rail site, um, but there isn't really any transportation method to get there, even biking. Um, so I'm, I'm strongly opposed to this. I hope you all will consider, you know, voting against rezoning this area. Um, it just doesn't make sense in the space. And I think it's going to have a lot more of an impact to the neighborhoods than um, has been indicated so far. Thank you. Thank you. Tamara Finn. Am I the last one? Uh, no, if I led you to believe that, I'm sorry. There are five I more I speakers. I the best for last. OK. Good evening. My name is Tamara Finn, and I live at 412 Nottingham Drive, which is four streets away from where this facility is proposed to be put up. And I'd like to just. Note to you guys in the front row, I don't think you live four streets from this facility. I can guarantee you that. Um, I want to just say that I am for the light rail. I'm just not for it being in my backyard. Um, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which if you know anything about Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, he has trolleys in Pittsburgh. So I grew up around trolleys, which look like Mr. Rogers' trolleys, but now it is a light rail system, and it has been for over 40 years there. I know exactly what it looks like. I know exactly what it sounds like, and we don't want any of this near where we live. It's very um, loud. There's clanking. I've heard somebody else say the screeching of metal on the rails. Um, that You will hear that. You will hear the ding, ding, ding of the trolley, which sounds cute on Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, but it's not in our backyard. When I watched the fly-through video, um, I was very shocked that the man was sitting there showing the video in front of the maintenance facility, and all you could hear were those said noises in the background. So it's not as quiet as it looks or it sounds. Um, in the winter, being four streets from Route 40, and there's no leaves on the trees, you can hear the sounds of Route 40. 
And the proposed vegetation um, sound screens that you're proposing, those will also lo lose their leaves and we will hear a lot of sounds in the winter time. Um, so all in all, I just think that it's ugly, it's unsightly, and I wish that it would be proposed to be put somewhere else and not in my backyard. Thank you. And thank you. So we do have five final speakers. I'm gonna call you all up now. Uh, Nancy Davis, Marlene Werner, Roger Werner, Jeff Prather, and John Martin. Uh, good evening, and thank you for being here and listening to us. Uh, I'm Nancy Davis. I live at 117 Donegal Drive, which is uh, the Oaks 3, right off Nottingham. So I guess I'm five streets away from this facility. But two things I need to say. First, this site is sensitive for two reasons. Other people have already mentioned the storm water runoff. I am dealing with flooding for the second time in five years. My basement is torn apart. I have to take up the hardwood floor. I've taken out the uh, paneling and I've taken out the uh, insulation. And then I have to figure out what to do about it if it happens again. Could be as early as this Thursday night. Now, that property that you're considering rezoning for industrial is a wetland. Ironically, I asked the Corps of Engineers for a permit to dredge, to, um, dredge my pond about seven years ago, and they said, no, we prefer wetlands. So I wonder what they're going to do when the proposal is made to them to destroy 80% of the streams that are going through that property and to clear cut 100%. The clear cutting, the first time I was flooded was uh, about five years ago when new communities had been put in and clear cutting had been approved to take every single tree down to hardscape to put coverage of asphalt and concrete over it. And what part of the hardscape that they want to do here is a one acre building. Out of the 23 acres, one acre will be one building. That's pretty amazing, and the rest will be asphalt rails. Oh, thank you very much. There's also an historic reason for not rezoning that area, but I wish Mr. Newton would speak to that. And thank you for your comments. Marlene Warner. My name is Marlene Werner, and I live at 106 Pino Court in the Villa Zacob Arbor. This is an over 55 community directly across the street from the area that you are considering rezoning. I have been a resident of the Durham Chapel Hill area for 21 years. What attracted me to this area and to my present home was the rural suburban nature of this section of Durham. I spent a good part of my life living in New York City suburbs that often felt as if they were part of the city with lots of traffic and congestion. I would hate to see this part of Durham become like that. In the short year and a half that I've lived in Culp Arbor, I've seen the traffic on Farrington Road increase. If the zoning is changed to industrial or light industrial, the traffic will get much worse and so will the air quality. There are many areas of Durham that are already zoned for industrial and light industrial. Please don't rezone our lovely residential area. The community I live in is filled with senior citizens. Nearby is Creekside Elementary School. The health and safety of the residents in this area should not be ignored. We all chose this area because it is residential, quiet, and rural. Please help us keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you. As Roger Warner comes up to speak, we have a few folks who came in who did want to sign up. And so if you are able, if you would like to speak, uh, I would just ask that you see Ms. Smith, who's in the back with an additional sign-up sheet. We are going to allow everyone time to speak if you would like to. Go ahead, sir. Members of the commission, my name is Roger Warner. Together with my wife, I am a resident of the villas at Culp Arbor. <clears throat> 
As you're well aware, this is a community directly across Barrington Road from the proposed rezoning area. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your time. No, <laughs> you were just getting going. We'll, we'll start it over. No worries. Uh, I'm not going to start from the beginning again. You, 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 you get the drift. Um, I do understand that certain circumstances may require unpleasant changes, changes that many of us really don't want to endure. However, this proposed rezoning makes little sense to me for a host of reasons. Changing the zoning from residential to industrial or light industrial on an already overcrowded street as Farrington Road clearly does not make sense considering the many, many areas of Durham that could accommodate this change without burdening the infrastructure of the surrounding area. Rezoning this area, should you move forward, would almost certainly have an environmental, as so many people have mentioned already, and health-related impact on all of the surrounding residential neighborhoods, and in this case, an elementary school as well. Our residence is an over 55 community, as you know, and seniors and youngsters from the Creekside School are absolutely at higher risk from environmental concerns, which are very likely to occur from potential industrial plants that could be constructed in the rezoned area, or even from chemicals that might be used, for example, to clean or service rail cars. There are so many things that this proposal has not addressed, that being significant among them. All of us in the affected area, and I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone, chose to live here because it is residential and reasonably rural. If additional industrial zoning is needed in Durham to accommodate this rail facility, I strongly urge you to consider it a different and less affected area than this one on Farrington Road and vote against this zoning proposal. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. You are worth the full two minutes. <laughs> uh, Jeff Prather and then John Martin, and then we do have three additional folks who have signed up to speak, and then we'll close the public hearing. Thank you. My name is Jeff Prather. I live at 108 Wicklow, uh, which is Durham County and the city of Chapel Hill. Uh, I am a retired environmental PE as well as a certified industrial hygienist. Most importantly, I'm the guy that used to have to answer the irate homeowner who called the Air Force Base at 8 o'clock in the morning complaining about the noise. I don't care what you say, Captain. That plane had to have been flying much lower. I know how loud it sounded. A couple of points of interest here. One, nighttime noise levels drop by around 10 dB above normal daytime. You take away the lawnmowers, you take away the traffic, and so your nighttime noise levels drop. Interesting scientific fact. An increase of 3 dB results in what the human ear perceives it is doubling the sound pressure level. So when they say, we're doing this at nighttime, reality is that's the worst time because your background noise levels are going to be much lower. So any increase in noise level is going to be perceived as that much louder. You talk about a 20-foot buffer. 20-foot buffer of what? New vegetation? Right now you got mature trees. What are they going to plant? You know, a few hollies? It will take a long time before that 20-foot buffer does anything to attenuate the noise levels. Believe me, I've had to answer for 21 years the irritating phone calls, and I've been yelled at, I've been called all types of names. Noise is a significant environmental issue. Do I have concerns about hazardous materials? Yes, I've done a lot of work on hazway sites, and those are a concern. But primarily, look at that. The other point that I would like to make, which hasn't been addressed at all, George King Road, all the way from George King to I-40, is going to be developed. You got the Keenan property already. You got Chapel Run. All of these are basically residential areas. And you're improving an industrial complex right next to it. Thank you, sir. John Martin. Good evening. My name is John Martin, and I do not live in the villas of Cope Arbor. I live, at, I live at 401 East Trinity Avenue in Old North Durham. I'm about as far away from this as I could get. So why am I 
opposed uh, to this. It's really simple. I've lived in Durham for more than 50 years, and in that period of time, I've seen a lot of bad planning and zoning decisions that have very much damaged neighborhoods. Do I have to mention urban renewal and Haiti and Edgemont um, just to give some obvious examples? But what I would say about those bad decisions is that they were often done with the best of intentions. We're going to make things better, they said, and yet they made a bad planning and zoning decision. That's what's going on here tonight. Light rail may be a very good thing, right? But putting an industrial facility in a residential neighborhood is a very bad zoning idea. Let me say that again. Putting an industrial facility in a residential neighborhood? Are you kidding me? What's the point of zoning if you're going to rezone residential to industrial? Would you entertain anybody else putting an industrial facility in that residential neighborhood or any other residential neighborhood in Durham? I don't believe that you would. Take the previous case. Suppose somebody bought the Pinecrest property and said, we want to rezone it industrial so we can put a cement plant there. You would laugh it out of this room because you know what damage it would do to the neighborhood. Now, I would urge you to consider the damages that you will do to these neighborhoods um, if you go ahead with this. That's not against light rail. There are other alternatives for where to place this that will not do such damage. Please, please think of these neighborhoods. Thank you. We, have, uh, we ask you not to, not to clap uh, rules procedure. Three final speakers, James Copel, Alex Cabanes, Cabanes, Chris, James, please come on up. <clears throat> Let me start by saying I'm sorry for your pronunciation. Right. Well, you got it right. All right. Yeah, I'm James Copel. I live at 216 Galway Drive in Durham County. And I also live with my wife there in my pad. Um, thank you for a couple minutes. You've heard a lot of opinions about why it's a bad idea to put an industrial zoning piece, zone piece of land in a residential area that's, I can't add to that, should not happen. It's not complicated. <clears throat> How do I know this? Well, first of all, I'm sure you have highly talented and competent staff that has been on the property and walked it, every square foot of it. I'm sure you have. You're busy, so I don't know that you have, and I would not judge that. But it takes about five minutes in a car to understand the conversations that have been going on tonight. You don't have to get out. You can windshield that thing, and you know that somebody had an idea that maybe we could buy a piece of land that's kind of trapped between the interstate and, this, and these, neighbor, uh, these residential areas and get it at a good price, and maybe we can put this complex that we need on it. I don't know what that story is, but it's, it's completely erroneous that it will work here. It'll be terrible. So, I'm almost done. When you drive home tonight, wherever you live, whether you live in a condo, whether you live in a neighborhood, wherever you live, when you get close, start to visualize a piece of property being rezoned industrial or light industrial and having a cement plant or a train yard on it. And it's, it's just, it's not complicated. So please don't do this. Uh, figure, figure out a plan B. Um, it's a mistake. Thank you. Thank you. Right, you can come on up. We've got two final speakers, Alex Cabanes, Chris, James. Good evening. My name's Alex Cabanes, and I live at 27 Tenured Court. I don't live anywhere close to where the romp is going to be. However, I think that these residents are going to have to live with the outcome of your decision. <clears throat> Go Triangle says a lot of really nice stories, and they've done a lot of outreach, but those outreach... Uh, sessions have not really been substantive. You basically have had the selection of, would you like this in blue or in green? Do you want this in 
uh, crate myrtle or spirea. Not really addressing the substantive issues that the residents that are gonna have to live with the outcome are having to deal with. Question is, what happens if you rezone and the light rail does not get built? What's gonna get built there instead? A cement factory or God knows what else. So why are we rushing to rezone when the funding for the light rail has not been secured? I find it amazing that eminent domain's already been used, the city still has to annex that territory, and they don't have the secured funding yet. Why? Why the rush? I think that the residents that are gonna have to bear the brunt of this rezoning and are gonna have to live with the impact of this decision should be given more weight than a lot of the pretty pictures and pretty presentations that Go Triangle and all the consultants give when they can do that in the comfort of their remote home, not having to deal directly with the impact of their decisions. Thank you. Thank you. And Chris James. Hi, my name is Chris James. I live at the 105 Great Oaks Place, and I probably have more specific experience in this topic than anybody in this room or not. So I spent 26 years in San Francisco Bay, 30 miles north or south of Palo Alto specifically, and I saw all kinds of great stuff out there and shenanigans and things that are just problematic. So the San Francisco Streetcar uh, Authority, I sponsored a project to redesign the brakes on, and I went through their maintenance facility a bunch of times. They're loud. They're incredibly loud, and you can't turn a streetcar easily. It has to be on a turnstile. That gets old, it decays, it generates waste. We'll get to the waste in a minute. So above the ground, there are problems. At the ground level, there are problems. Below the ground level, there are problems in different cases. I'm pro light rail, by the way, very pro, just not a facility of that type there. At the ground level, the, the disruption of the traffic is easy to demonstrate with math. I can do that simply. It's operations research. You take a T <coughs> and you have a stoplight at the other side and there's an interest rate of a certain amount of cars at one point and you interject another stop point every five minutes with indeterminate dwell at that stop and that stop sign, there'll be no traffic that gets through there reasonably, if not ever. So that's the part that's at the ground level. It's a problem with this plan. It's a train wreck waiting to happen, no pun intended. <laughs> or did I? Yeah, no, I didn't intend. But last and most important, the last house I bought in California in 2000, in Palo Alto, in Palo Alto, California, three blocks from Steve Jobs, six blocks from Larry Page of Google, across the street from David Packard's son, two doors down from a Nobel laureate, I had to sign a waiver the first thing that said, you are buying a house on top of a Superfund site. It was a Superfund site created in 1981 by Hewlett Packard from a leaky maintenance facilities gas tank that was below the ground with reagent caustic materials that are all used to clean things. That can go through geologic strata if it's the right strata at the right time on a beeline. It had gone three miles in 10 years. It was underneath most of the town of Palo Alto and it still is. You can imagine the horror, spending the amount of money you can imagine that house might have cost. And it says, you're on a Superfund site. This facility has exactly the same uh, potential of a train wreck that doesn't need to happen. And it's really serious. I mean, this is, I'd be, let me put it this way. This hey, is thank, sir, thank you. Bonanza Sorry, waiting to, happen Sorry to cut to you off, but we've, we've got a, we've given everyone two minutes, so I, I appreciate your time. I will leave the charge on all the injunctions that follow happily. I'm sorry? I will, follow, I will leave the charge on all the injunctions that will happen, happen happily, and we have lots of funding we could use. Happily. Thank you for your time. So I want to thank everyone for speaking during the public hearing. We're now going to close the public hearing, and this is the time for the commissioners to be able to ask questions, make comments. So I will look to my left if there are any commissioners that wish to speak. Commissioner Williams. Thank you, everybody, for your comments and your very heartfelt uh, statements about the impact of this. I, I too, have concerns about implementing um, impermeable surfaces and the effects of the runoff that that's going to generate in this particular area and in areas going forward. I also have concerns about the noise that will be generated from the rail service being implemented in what is seemingly a quiet community. Um, I say that because I live in a not quiet community, but before they started widening 147 in Austin Avenue, there was a train that came through at about three o'clock in the morning. 
and it was a very loud process, so I definitely sympathize with you. Um, giving the concerns of everyone in here as residents and the considerations that you're looking for, I don't think that anything that you're asking for is a far reach. I don't think that anything that you're asking for is too much. And I think that you have every right as citizens, as taxpayers to feel how you feel. And I am here to tell you based off everyone that I've heard today as residents, but not as an opposition to mass transit, but as residents and what you consider home, that I hear you just as I have in other cases and as a Durham resident and even with Hillsborough and Orange County being as close as it is, I hear you. And I too have reservations that address every concern that you have spoken about this evening. And I would like to know further about how these concerns would be addressed. And I definitely have concerns about whether or not this is the right area. Being a Durham native, I do know of several instances of implementation where suggestions of putting this somewhere else would be more appropriate, if you will. Um, not wanting to speak out of turn or to overstep my own boundaries, but I do want you to know that you have been heard. Every last one of you have been heard tonight, even those that did not speak, and you definitely have a voice here. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gibbs. Thank you so much for those comments. Uh, and that just about uh, meshes with the way I was going to speak. Uh, I, for years, I've been a proponent of mass transit, regional mass transit. Light rail is not really connected to anywhere but Durham and Chapel Hill. Uh, but that's, that's another issue. That's not what we're talking about tonight. Whatever rail we have has got to have a place to be worked on, adjusted, and, and its impact is probably everything that you have, uh, all of you speakers have brought up. Uh, and that in listening to to all of this tonight, I, I'm wondering, uh, we're speaking of light rail, it almost seems to me there's been some light communication. I may be speaking out of the top of my head, but I would like to ask the residents and the developers uh, from Go and Go Triangle, have y'all had sat down and had the kind of conversations that I have heard with the comments from the people and and others so that you can make some headway. It, it's been my, it seems to me that this has been going on for a pretty good while. And I would think by now there would be some frank discussions uh, and made it and make it public so that we don't have to argue it and uh, and we just pass our uh, our recommendations along to those who will make the decisions so uh, there just seems to be something missing in the communication of of this thing and I I was had been, well, I've been for and against this thing, I, I have to admit. And right now, I'm, I, I'd like to see some further communication and further planning uh, from, from the designers, uh, uh, the developers. Uh, there's just an awful lot of stuff going on that I had hoped would have been resolved by the time this meeting occurred, but evidently not, and that's all. Thank you, Commissioner Gibbs. Commissioner Miller? So I have some questions for staff, um, because this is 
the development plan I had before me is not like any other that we've ever had before. Uh -huh. We've never had a train facility before, and not least not least in my experience. So there's a lot to, to be learned here. Um, one of the things that concerns me, and, and again, we spent a lot of time contrasting this case with the Forest Hills case that we also heard tonight. Uh, this property, uh, the development plan, and maybe we can show this, um, uh, has got three areas of stream buffers. I'll, I'll let Jamie catch up to me. All right, thanks. So there's three areas of stream buffers here, but as I understand the development plan, uh, we've got parking and even the building envelope overlaps the stream buffers. We don't let other developments do that. How is it that these areas encroach on the stream buffers in, in this project? Okay, thank you for pulling it up. So there is a text commitment, I'm just finding it on here now, that um, is a caveat that the, that the applicant is going to have to um, secure all of the necessary permitting requirements through all of the other outside agencies that would be part of the buffer encroachments pertaining to the riparian areas, the environmental um, any environmental encroachments. I appreciate that, but doesn't our UDO say you can't build in the stream buffers? Where does our UDO say you can you can have a parking lot or a building in a stream buffer? Why is this one different than the others? Good evening, Sarah Young with the planning department. The UDO does allow instances for encroach, different types of encroachments into stream buffers. There's actually a very lengthy section with a table with all sorts of different types of encroachments and the particular approval process for them. I looked at those. Right, and so. I didn't find one that I thought matched this, but maybe I misunderstood it. So in this case, they're specifically asking um, to show some of those on here and get them approved through this method as opposed to some of the other methods. So. Uh, that is why you will see they have depicted um, the different places where they may encroach through and the reasons for that. Hopefully you, we can, Jamie may be able to better point out the specifics. Hang on. And can, can you cite me the section of the UDO that we're relying on here? Thanks. I would. And Commissioner Miller, feel free to continue and we can come back with the right. answer. And the same thing is true with, with wetlands. We've got the, the parking is right over the top of, of wetlands. And we've seen other cases where uh, the developers procured the opinion of engineers that, that wetlands, as they would be defined by the somewhat old manuals that we use, are uh, no longer actually uh, wetlands under the current rules. And the same thing happens, I guess, with streams and stream buffers and their classifications. But there's no indication that any of that kind of thing happened here. I'm just really concerned that we're treating this development so much differently without the kind of explanation that, as a lawyer, I would like to see. Uh, I admit that, that sometimes I'm confused when I read the, the code and misunderstand what it means. Um, but I would like to feel secure if I recommend this to the city council that we're not actually breaking our rules. Um, because we essentially obliterate all three stream buffers and the wetlands. Uh, this is the first time when I've ever seen a development plan where we are, we're being asked to approve that. Um, at this point, I would suggest that the applicant um, come up and address your specific questions regarding that, because we have had conversations regarding this. Um, so I would I would defer that question to them. Okay. So, so enlighten me. Tell me what part of the code we're using. And if you don't mind, if you can give us your name and address again. 
Hi, I'm Jeff Green. Um, my home address is 111 Simmerville Road in Chapel Hill. Um, I'm a senior planner, uh, and I'm here on behalf of Go Triangle. Um, I think one of the reasons that this is unusual is that this is part of a major transportation project of the type that typically um, does not come before the Planning Commission. Um, we are, uh, as part of the uh, environmental, we had an extensive environmental process that we went through um, to get to this point. Uh, between 2011 and 2012, we did what is called an alternatives analysis, where we looked at various um, options for the transportation corridor before settling on uh, the light rail, as well as um, various alternatives, including four alternatives for a rail operations and maintenance facility. Uh, after that, in about 2013, we did this process called scoping, where we went out to the community, showed these alternatives, and said, you know, what else should we look at? One of the items that actually uh, Durham City Council requested was that we look at a fifth site for the rail operations and maintenance facility. Uh, we then, through the uh, process established um, on, by the U.S. Department of Transportation and the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, entered the environmental analysis. We did what's called the draft environmental impact statement. As part of that, we are required to um, avoid any impacts to streams, wetlands, uh, and open waters wherever possible uh, along the entire transportation corridor. Um, and I think, you know, over the, this is a 17.7 mile corridor uh, with about 18 stations, and that's what we've tried to do. Um, this site was chosen um, through that, after that extensive draft environmental impact statement process as the preferred alternative for the operations and maintenance facility. Um, it does have impacts to wetlands and streams and riparian buffers. Um, and we are uh, committed as part of our amended record of decision issued by the Federal Transit Administration to addressing these impacts on a project-wide basis. Um, we well, are. I appreciate all that. I just are, want to know the section of the UDO that allows these facilities. I will. I will defer to staff as far as how the UDO applies. Um, but I'm trying to give you the background as to I, how. I, I just wanted the UDO section. That's all. Thank you. So, staff, they have deferred back to you. So I, it's a, it was our um, our understanding that there is an application for some determinations of the riparian areas, and the reason they're shown on this plan is because if they actually are riparian when they go to um, submit for their site plan, they would have to adhere to those standards at that time. However, they showed the parking and building envelope in case these areas were deemed, or there was a determination made that they wouldn't be. There's some is corners. That, it's not wiping out the entire area. It's a couple of corners that they've encroached into. No, it's, it's, it's dramatic. So, <laughs> it's, I'm sorry, which ones are you talking about? So, oh. What? Yeah, point. The, I'm talking about actual riparian buffers. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. This is an actual riparian buffer. Mm -hmm. Well, there's the track view. There's the no, that, that actually already. that exists that ex already. That exists already. Right. So the the parking and and you can have drives in those areas. Those Commissioner Miller, if you can come back, I know they asked you to point up yeah. there, but then if you don't I mind speaking into the microphone. Talking. Yes, it was eight five nine G of the UDO allows for driveways in those areas. Mm -hmm. But does it allow parking lots and buildings? Those particular, the two, the two, on, the one on the um, the upper, on the Farrington side was my understanding that they've asked for a determination on that one. If that one goes away, that's not an issue. But if they don't get that determination by the time site plan comes around, they cannot build in that area. Is that explained on the it, text of, of, right, the, of the development plan? It does. And if they okay. don't show it on the development plan as presented tonight, they would have to come back through the rezoning process again. So that's why it's being shown, and that's why there's a text commitment that they would have to comply. Well, so tell me that, give me that citation option. again, please. Is it 859G? Eight, eight, right. Thank you. So, and, the, and we deferred you back to the applicant because I thought maybe they would explain to you if they've asked for the determinations. That's what we were looking for because we don't have the ability to tell you where those stand. So Thank I you. understand they had applied for those. So, so I, I'm, so I'm, I'm also confused about how this project can be consistent with objective 4.2.1 and policy 4.2.1A in the comprehensive plan, which encourages or requires retention and incorporation of unique site fe features into open space, which includes wetland streams, et cetera. This doesn't seem to do that. How can it be consistent? Um, we didn't talk about that in the site plan, and I don't see it as being consistent. 
Uh, I have to say I was also persuaded by Mr. Post's remark, I believe it was Mr. Post that said that the site isn't big enough, and I agree that it's not big enough. I mean, we have to invade the, the, the major transportation corridor buffer, and we, we have to invade stream uh, riparian buffers, and we have to uh, go across wetlands, and we have to reduce the right-of-way of Farrington Road in order to, to get everything in here that's supposed to go in here. It really worries me. The, these are policy inconsistencies that I don't think that that uh, work for me. But I will say this: uh, we have to build a facility like this somewhere. Uh, and I understand that we looked at several sites. You guys did. We have not. Uh, the only other site that has come before us in my time here is the one that's now having a Ford dealership built on it, and I opposed that. Uh, because I thought it was a better site. Uh, I have to say it concerns me that this site uh, is not within easy walking distance of a station. The Charlotte romp makes a lot of sense. And I'm grateful to the applicant for actually showing me some pictures of that facility and helping me understand what it looks like and, and how it works, but this isn't going to work the same way. It's in a different environment. Now, I am I have to say that I was also uh, somewhat persuaded by the fact that once that facility went in, uh, the development community has built uh, residential complexes right up against it. And so it, it, it indicates to me that it is possible to have a facility like this in some proximity to residential areas. But the uh, one of the speakers said it does make a difference when the facility is there first, and residential development comes to it. It's a little bit different here, uh, where we're putting the, the facility in the, in the environment that has already been developing according to a different trend. Um, I am astounded that we are concluding that this is, uh, complies with the contiguous development policy, 2.3.1a, uh, where we put this kind of facility in this area uh, because, and I realize it's the idea is that we put buffers, but a 20-foot buffer at a 40% opacity isn't much of a buffer. Um, not for a facility like this, not one that's going to be open all the time, lit all the time, operating all the time. I just don't see how that can make this uh, industrial zoned facility uh, appropriate in terms of co the contiguous development policy. I mean, we're talking about two zones at the absolute opposite ends of the zoning spectrum. Now, we c it is possible with appropriate buffering, in my opinion, to work that out, but a 20-foot buffer with a 40% opacity isn't enough. And I asked the the applicants when I met with them, and I was grateful for the time that I was able to spend with them, whether they would consider increasing the opacity inside the buffer if they couldn't make the buffer bigger. And I was told tonight that, that they had determined that, that they were not going to do that, and I was disappointed. Um, so, uh, and I have a long list, and I'm not going to take up all your time. It's, it's all more of the same. Um, I did have to say that I looked at the pictures they showed me of the Charlotte facility. It's not a bad-looking building. Uh, it had some things in it that I thought looked good. It is a building that I would expect to see in an urban setting, not a suburban setting. But even so, I look at the materials list on this development plan, and they've limited themselves to concrete and steel and glass, exposed concrete. They're, the Charlotte facility is clad in brick. The Charlotte facility has a sawtooth skylight line, uh, which I think adds visual interest. Uh, and I, I point that out to say that they shouldn't necessarily all have that kind of uh, thing, but there should be, if we're trying to make this a, a good neighbor to vastly different neighbors nearby, we should have design commitments in here. And they should be design commitments that the community has worked with the applicant on uh, because nobody knows what's appropriate for the community better than the people who live in the community. And that obviously has not happened here. I get the, I've, 
I, twice now we've had a litany of the meetings that have been held, but they are presented to us by the applicant as, as they were boxes that they had to check off. It doesn't really sound like the, the level of engagement that, that brought about a successful conclusion of the Forest Hills property where the, actually the people were only this far apart. Uh, this is harder, but we need to do the hard work. Uh, one of the people who wrote to us, at least wrote to me, said, you know, up in the Lee Village area where there is a station, there is a large acreage up there that's, that's just a wooded lot. Uh, why is this facility not being considered for that place? Um, we talked a lot about noise when I met with the, the folks, and I went and tried to look up noise impacts of, of light rail, and I admit that I poked around on the internet, and that's not, not necessarily the best source of information. But what I learned was is that light rail makes noise when the tracks are worn, when the wheels are worn, or when you ask the wheels to, do, to make relatively sharp turns, because then the wheel flanges, I learned so much, uh, the wheel flanges actually come in contact with the side of the tracks. Uh, this facility has a very tight loop in it, which almost every train that enters the Rompf building uh, must go through. And I don't know how many times you're going to take trains in and out of the building, but if it's happening at night, if there's going to be loud steel-on-steel -steel generated noise, it's going to happen here. Uh, and it's probably not going to happen on the long, relatively straight st stretches of track or those stretches of track where the where the turns are on very broad, uh, broad um, cords. So uh, I have to say that if this is the best site out of the five sites that were considered during the environmental uh, assessment, uh, how bad must do the others have been? <laughs> um, I realize that that there's a great deal of anxiety among the folks who are working very, at Go Triangle who are working very, very hard to bring us a good quality light rail transit system. And I appreciate that. And I believe that they have a lot of things they are trying to pull together at one time. They're trying to secure federal funding from an administration that, quite frankly, isn't necessarily very supportive. Uh, they are, a lot of things have to happen. and. They don't want delays, and they do not want setbacks. They do not want to give anybody who might oppose this another reason to argue against it, and I don't either. Um, but certainly, we could do a better. If this is going to be the site, cannot we work together as a community better to make it a better site than the, than the way it is described on this development plan? And is there not time, once, once again, to maybe look at, at some of these other sites? Now realize, folks, that wherever this goes, there's going to be a community like you that's going to have a great deal of heartburn. And I guess part of what we have to do is choose which community is heartburn is the worst. Um, and But right now, this is we're not presented alternatives, and I kind of resent that. Uh, we don't get to choose between several. We get, we get to look at them one at a time, or just one. Maybe we'll never be asked to see another one, because that's in their power. We can't generate the cases. They have to generate the case. Um, I would like to see a better plan. I believe that maybe there could be a better plan. Maybe there can't, though, uh, because there's not much space on this site um, because it is so long and, and narrow. Uh, but it could be a better design building. It could be a better thought-out buffer. Um, I'm going to vote no. Uh, yesterday I was going to vote yes, uh, but I am persuaded by what you've told me. Uh, I am not persuaded that this is consistent with our plans. I'm not consistent. Con uh, I'm not uh, satisfied that we're treating this applicant like we would treat another applicant, and I believe the rules should apply and the policy should apply to all the projects the same way. I realize we're playing a high-stakes game here, and I do not want to be the member of the Planning Commission who led the charge that defeated light rail. But I'm not talking about defeating light rail. I'm talking about making a better uh, neighbor of this facility to whoever is going to live nearest it, and that includes you folks. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Vice Chair Hyman? Well, I certainly have less to say after listening to Commissioner uh, Miller, who addressed a, a number of areas that 
concern me, but my comments are more in line with uh, both uh, Commissioner Gibbs and Commissioner Williams. Um, it was my hope that a lot of the, the issues that were raised here today would have been resolved. We've been to this place before where we had large numbers of, of individuals who had come in and objected to an issue that was being presented. Yesterday, um, as I listened to both sides of this issue, the one question that I asked, um, I, I wanted to know what the residents wanted. And the response I got was, they did not want to see it, smell it, or hear it. So I was under the impression that all of those issues had been addressed. Did not want to see it, did not want to hear it, did not want to smell it. Um, yesterday, I felt comfortable knowing that this issue had been addressed. Today, I'm not comfortable, and basically, um, I'm at the same place that my commissioners are. I can't really support this because so many individuals have not had their issues addressed. One of the things I advocate for is that our individuals, our residents be heard. And right now, there are too many of you who have not been heard. So those are my comments, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Durkin. I just wanted to say thank you for everyone to come out tonight. I'm excited that there's progress in the light rail plan and I'm excited to vote yes to this project. Uh, one thing I think would be helpful is if someone from Go Triangle could just briefly 500 foot overview of why the other sites that were considered were not sufficient and why this one is sufficient. Thank you, Madam. Uh, Jeff Green, Go Triangle once again. Um, we, the five sites, so this was called the Farrington site. Um, we had another site called Lee Village. It overlaps significantly with this site. Um, the northern end is roughly um, where um, Ephesus Church Road is on the development plan. Uh, it went a little further south. Um, we are a uh, federal, we're a project trying to get federal funding. Um, FTA, the Federal Transit Administration, is managing it. And one of the rules that we need to follow is if there's a um, project that will impact a historic site. You can't use it if there is a reasonable alternative that does not impact the historic site. And so because of the historic site just south of the Farrington um, site, we could not move forward. That's why that, uh, that site was decided not to move forward. Um, another site we looked at uh, as Can commissioner. Can I interrupt you really quick? Is that the same site that you? No, that's the next one. Okay. Uh, the, the next one was uh, at Patterson Place um, that Commissioner Miller mentioned. Uh, it's roughly uh, between that apartment complex that's been there uh, and the new auto dealership that's going in. That facility was um, feasible in conjunction with an earlier alignment of the light rail project uh, that we had proposed during the alternatives analysis. In this earlier uh, proposal, the light rail went from, uh, as it does today, from a station at Patterson Place to a station at Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway. Um, but it got there by making, by going straight across New Hope Creek from Patterson Place over to the Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway station, basically making a new transportation corridor across New Hope Creek. One of the things we heard during scoping um, and from the city council was people were concerned about the impact that this new crossing would have on the New Hope Creek. And so we committed during the environmental process to look at an alternative <laughs> that once it got to Patterson Place would sort of turn, I guess, to the left if you're going from Chapel Hill to, Dur to downtown Durham, go up towards 15501 uh, and then cross New Hope Creek in within the existing US 15501 corridor. Um, that's the one we decided to move forward to because it minimized the environmental impacts on the New Hope Creek. Um, but one of the, the uh, consequences of that was the Patterson Place facility was no longer feasible. Um, we had a facility uh, at Cornwallis Road. It's roughly where the Durham Herald Sun building, the old Durham Herald Sun building is located. Um, there were some operational uh, challenges with that and also some cost challenges with building it. It was also adjacent to uh, the existing Levin Jewish Community Center campus. I think there's a school there and some other facilities. Um, and it was determined that the impacts that it would have to those immediately adjoining neighbors 
um, is one of the reasons why, along with the increased cost, are the reasons why that option was not moved forward with. So those were the, the four. I would, I would ask the, that we, we let each, our public hearing has closed. I appreciate that you all have taken time to speak. We're now at the point where the commissioners will ask an individual a question directly, and that individual will answer. So I appreciate your patience. Thank you. So those are the four sites that came out of the alternatives analysis. Uh, the fifth one that came out of scoping that uh, Durham City Council recommended was uh, along the uh, existing freight rail line uh, next to uh, sort of east of Alston Avenue on the site of the Brentag facility. Um, that's an operating facility. Uh, one of the concerns of that, uh, there were several concerns. First of all, putting the ROMP facility there would have required closing an existing and operating business. Um, we, I think our calculation was the number of jobs that the ROMP would bring uh, would be less than the number of jobs that would be lost because of the closure of the Brentag facility. Uh, Brentag is one of those companies that they don't need to be in Durham, they need to be on a rail line. So if they're forced to move, there's no guarantee that they're gonna stay in Durham, much less the state of North Carolina. That's one concern. Uh, another concern is um, Brentag has been there for a while. Um, there's a risk of, uh, high risk of hazardous materials underground, and so that was a high risk of really increased cost for the project if the facility's there. There are also some challenges, especially since we've uh, extended the line with the station at NCCU with actually getting to that site because it's a little bit off of the main line. Thank you. Any additional questions, Commissioner? No. Thank you. Commissioner El Turk. Thank you, Chair, and again, thanks to everyone for coming out. Um, and sharing your feedback. Um, I, I, I do think we're in a tough position um, because I, I know that Grove Triangle has put a lot of effort into this and, and they're trying to, as Commissioner Miller said, um, there are a lot of moving pieces here and trying to secure funding. But I am ultimately convinced by most many of the opponents that we're not here you know, to, to hear the merits of light rail. We're here to hear the merits of a rezoning case. Um, and so I, I think part of the difficulty is that, again, as Commissioner Miller alluded to, we don't get rail um, transit projects ever, right? And so we don't have, at least for me, I don't, I don't think any of us are rail experts, uh, we don't have any idea of what the real impact of this will be. So. If, if a rezoning comes before us and it's a retail project or a grocery store or you know, something, we have an idea of what, what kind of impact that would have. We get a great staff report, but, you know, and they tell us what the adverse impacts are on traffic, water, and schools. But as many of you have pointed out, there are other adverse impacts that I do not think that or at least for me, they have not been addressed. So I guess for the sake of full information, or at least I would like some more information, I have, I have a few questions for the applicant. So in one of the text commitments, text commitment three, you say it will not, the ROMP will not include a vehicle body repair or vehicle paint shop. So these functions will be performed offsite. But can you give us a sense of, so what will be done on the, the, the cars? Is it, again, I, I think we need at least some sense of what's happening there. I'm, I'm gonna ask uh, Dave Charters from our engineering team to, to come up okay. um, to help answer that question for you. Okay. And let me ask a more simple question maybe. So it, will this be a 24 seven facility? It will, yes. And, and what kinds of vehicles will be coming in and out? And maybe the engineer can answer, but what kind of vehicles will be? Because we, we meant, we've talked about traffic impact, mm -hmm. but we need to also know what kinds of, uh, a couple of neighbors have mentioned the kinds of vehicles that will be coming in, like trucks, right? So can you give us a sense of what kinds of vehicles will be coming in and out on a regular basis? I'll turn that over to, to Mr. Charters in okay, a moment, great. but I think the majority of vehicles accessing and egressing the site will be um, employees coming to work. I see, okay. Thank you for the clarification. Good evening, Commission. My name is Dave Charters. I'm managing the design and engineering for the light rail project for Go Triangle. Um, to answer the question of what 
um, operations are occurring at the facility. So there's um, a few distinct parts to the buildings. The southernmost part on the site is called a maintenance away building. And in that facility, it includes staff uh, locations and maintenance um, facilities within there to take care of um, align, uh, elements along the trackway that need to be repaired, whether it's parts of the rail, um, parts of the bridges, um, the ties, the different parts of the trainway. So it's called maintenance of way because that's the part of the track that's outside along the 18 miles of the project that the staff will have to maintain. Um, outside of the building, there's a storage area where the stone, as you can see in a railroad track, the stone next to the rails and the ties is stored. So it's really a maintenance function within that building. Um, the next part of the building to the north is called the light, rail, the light rail vehicle maintenance building. And that's where there's a couple functions in that building. Uh, on the second floor is the operations control center. It's basically a, a large room that has computer screens to monitor all of the light rail trains along the 18 mile system see where everything's at coming in and out of the stations. On the second floor, there's also administrative buildings, offices for the managers of the operators. On the first floor of that maintenance facility is where there are um, three different tracks that come into the building, where the vehicles pull into the building, they're cleaned, they're uh, relatively light maintenance service to repair elements on the vehicles that are damaged or worn out from service. Um, Major components of the, of the light rail vehicles um, would be contracted out to be outside of the building. We mentioned as a commitment not to do um, body work or paint, have a paint shop. And that was one of the things that we heard from the multiple meetings we had with the community, that they were concerned with toxic smells and toxic, toxic elements that would be in the building for maintenance. So we committed, although Many light rail systems around the country um, have that function within the building. We took it upon ourselves to commit to the community that we would not do that in the building. We would, if there's a damage to a vehicle from a, a car accident or whatever, those parts of the light rail vehicle would be dismantled and shipped out of the building to another site, whether it's our bus operations or another facility to maintain. Um, so within the middle part of the building, that's where the vehicles are maintained and serviced. Um, a third part of the building is on the east side, and that's pretty much the car wash. So it's a fourth track that goes through the site where the cars are pulled into an enclosed part of the building. You don't see it, and they're washed just like a car wash where you would pull into a, a BP gas station or whatever. And so those are the main functions of the building. Um, outside of the building is a storage yard, as was explained, where there are two tracks that are going to be built initially to, to um, store... Uh, up to 24 vehicles. The project at Revenue Service will start out with only 18 vehicles um, purchased, but it allows for uh, later expansion as we hope the project is successful. Does that answer you. your question? I guess. So you said a type of vehicle is coming into the site also? Yeah, right. So um, as, as Mr. Green mentioned, most of the vehicles coming in and out of the site will be the, the operators, the workers, the maintainers. It is a 24-7 operation. Um, there will be some delivery trucks that bring in supplies to deliver um, stone or other parts of the project that need to be maintained. Thank you. So I guess the, maybe the bigger question is that the thing that kept coming up for a lot of people was the noise. Sure. Uh, has there been a noise study? Can we, is there any way for us to know or estimate how much noise there would be at different times during, during the day? Absolutely. So as part of the environmental impact statement that was prepared back in 2015 and 2016, there is a separate uh, noise and vibration technical report that was done for the initial um, environmental impact statement. Um, subsequent to that, what happens is we had a uh, record of decision issued by the Federal Transit Administration where they approved the alignment, the number of stations, the site for the maintenance facility. And um, the FTA accepted the noise and vibration report at that time. We've had some um, changes along the 18 miles of the project since 2016. 
So we're in the process of updating the environmental document at the end of this month. It'll be issued for public comment. There is an appendix, another updated um, technical report on noise and vibration that has been done based on the latest design for the maintenance facility and all the things that have changed over the last couple of years on the project. So that will be available. We have an initial um, uh, noise and vibration report that's available now from the um, earlier environmental statement. And we'll have a supplemental version that'll be part of the public review comment uh, document coming out the end of the month. So we have looked at, um, we have, a, as is existing today, a, if you go up Farrington Road towards the maintenance facility in Patterson Mill Stores on the left, Colt Barber's on the, on, on the Patterson Mill Stores on the right, Colt Barber's on the left. On the Colt Barber's side, for part of that length of the development, there is a, an earthen berm, a, a kind of a little hill along the side of the sidewalk that the developer has put in to help shield the community from noise. We propose to install a similar berm on the east side of Farrington Road, again, to help shield noise from I-40, because as has been mentioned, by removing the tree buffer between I-40 and the development, the noise from I-40 can, can be heard. And so a number of mitigation items that we have on the project is to add a berm along the east side of Farrington, the romp side, along with the, the, the vegetative buffer that was mentioned, plus in the noise analysis that will be available at the end of the month that's in the document, the building itself acts as a shield to the development because of the height of the building. It's blocking um, the noise coming from I-40 towards the development. So there's a number of things that we have on the site. There's retaining walls because of the depth of the building. So there's a number of elements on the site that are helping to block um, the noise. Okay. Thank you, that was very helpful. Um, I, I guess maybe Maybe you can answer this for somebody else. At, at this point, uh, if the commissioner asks for a specific individual to speak, they can come up and speak, but, but we have closed the Absolutely. public hearing. Commissioner Alturk? Thank you. So in the staff report, there's something about lighting here uh, and that there will be source shielding will be used, but I don't see that in the text commitment. I just see that the text commitment 14 says it will be shielded to aim light away from property boundaries. Right, so that's actually a, a similar type. The wording might be a little different, but its intent is the same. So on all of the light fixtures out in the yard or adjacent to the building, the, the, the light um, elements themselves will have shields that direct the light downward into the facility and doesn't let the light spread. Like if you're at a highway interchange and you have the high lights around a highway interchange and the light spreads out all over the interchange, the lights in the yard are, are directed directly into the facility. And we have copies of what we call photometric studies where there's actually a computer program that simulates the yard at night and where all these lights are. And it shows the, the, that the light stays within the yard. It doesn't spill out into Farrington Road or across to the community or even towards I-40 and, and distract traffic. Thank you. So I guess a follow-up to all these questions. Have these, you know, the, the study you've done on noise, this, mm -hmm. you know, this more detailed kind of explanation of light, um, you know, the kinds of repairs that would go on, have these been discussed with the neighbors? I'm seeing a lot of nodding no's, but I... Um, so I, I know there's... And, and Commissioner Alturk, is there a I would like to ask the applicant. Of the applicant, yes. thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's an excellent question, as there was a slide um, in Mr. Talmadge's presentation and uh, as in the Go Triangle presentation that showed some of the meetings that we've had over the last couple of years for the environmental document, and um, I personally have been at the Culp Arbor Recreation Center for a, for a meeting with the community, and also I've been at Creekside Elementary a couple of times to meet with the community. We've sponsored workshops with the community to foster communication on uh, what are the things that are most important to the community that they're concerned with, and what are the, what are the ways that they have in their mind that they would like to, how they would like to address those concerns. So we've had those in, in public meetings. We had a public meeting where we had examples of the type of finishes on the building 
um, examples of the gates and fences around the site for the community to choose from, um, examples of types of vegetative buffer to choose from. So I think we've tried to, there's always room for more, um, but I think we've tried to reach out to the community in an, at least three occasions that I'm aware of that I attended, um, where we've offered the variations on the type of building materials, the fence materials, the railing materials, the vegetative buffer materials, and, and ask for their input on how they would like to see those as part of the design. Thank you. Um, that was very helpful, thank you. I, you know, it's, this, again, this is a, a, a tough case and I, I'm still on the fence about this. But I, ultimately I, I think that, we, I, at least I don't feel comfortable voting in favor if I don't have what I, at least full information on some of the impacts that would, uh, possible impacts. And I, you've helped me quite a bit in, in, in getting there. But I guess what I'm hearing is, and what I maybe I'll reiterate what Commissioner, Commissioner Miller was maybe trying to get to is that maybe we can get to a compromise. And you know I do think that we were we will probably have to put an industrial site somewhere close to a residential area. It you know somebody's going to have to take the burden, um, and maybe this is not the right site. I don't know, um, but I would like to see. Some compromises made, maybe maybe a little bit more, you know, information given to residents, and maybe a little bit more input. And and like some have alluded or mentioned, it may not be possible. But I think as it stands right now, I'm, I'm probably going to vote against this um, because I think there could be more done on this uh, to, to alleviate some of the concerns of the neighbors. And I do appreciate what Go Triangle is doing at the same time. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Kenshin, and then Commissioner Miller for some additional comments. Yeah, um, first I do appreciate Go Triangle and the work that's been done. And I do appreciate hearing from the residents too. Uh, my daughter went to Creekside for six years from kindergarten through fifth grade. So I took 40 to 54 to Farrington Road twice a day, 180 days a year for six years. So I know a little bit about that trip and about the community over there. And uh, I, I don't know though, I'm not in favor of kicking the can down the road. Um, I'm not in favor of that. I don't know that there's, it could be a site that Go Triangle could pick. And I have to, we have to trust that people have put the time into this and studied it and staff has done their job. I don't know that there's a site that anyone can pick that folks can come in. There won't be a room full of folks saying, not in my backyard. Uh, I just don't know that's possible. Um, so I wanted to ask two questions, but Commissioner Al uh asked all of them. My questions were going to be about uh, how much have you engaged the community with this important uh, topic, especially about the impacts. Um, I wanted to know how much will they will they see it, smell it, hear it, and you. One more I didn't think about was how much will they feel it. Um, it sounds like some real work's been done for this, but I, I just think that you know we can kick the can down the road, um, which I hope we don't do. Uh, they're going to pick another. If they pick another site, there's going to be a room full of folks saying, "Not in my backyard." Um, and I'm just not in favor of that. Um, I understand, and I understand the, the fear, and I understand the resentment the folks who live there feel. Uh, I just think there's got to be a way to mitigate the impact. Um, I mean, driving down Fair I can see it down Farrington Road. I can see things being done to mitigate so that it won't be um, this awful thing that people can, see, can think about it. So, um, you know, I just would urge my commissioners to just, I mean, it's not going to ever be, you know, you're not going to be in this room faced with picking a site where it won't be a room full of folks saying that in my backyard. So, um, but thanks to everyone. I appreciate hearing from you, and uh, I, I feel like we can make this work. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Miller? So I heard you talk about a berm. We talked about a berm when we met yesterday, but there's no berm on the development plan. Are you proffering a berm in the uh, along the east side of Farrington Road at this juncture? Are you committing to that? Yes. You are committing to a berm. Yes. So what kind of berm are you committing to? It's an earthen berm. Um, some of the things that we've learned on and- Wait a second, I want to make sure staff is listening because sometimes they have heartburn about <laughs> proffers that happen at this stage. So tell us about the berm. So um, on the development plans, 
Um, because of the ongoing design nature, we're not always able to put all of the design features and all of the design details on a development plan. We have from the 30% design and we're now well past 50% design, we've been showing a berm along that road uh, along the east side in order to help shield the noise from our neighbors across the street. And that was one of the things that came out of our multiple meetings with the community to understand what their concerns were. Like as was mentioned, they don't want to hear it, smell it, see it, feel it, whatever. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to hide it with the vegetation. We have a, a eight to 10 foot high berm along the east side of the road to help shield it. And the running noise. from where to where? Um, it's from the south uh, property line heading up towards the entrance to the building. And actually it goes beyond the entrance that's at Ephesus Church up around towards the um, Farrington Road Bridge. So we're, we're willing to proffer that this evening as a commitment. And let's just check in with the staff as we usually do when there's a commitment being proffered. Uh, Grace Smith with staff. Uh, we, they did mention a berm in discussions earlier uh, but when they applied and they weren't at the point where they could proffer that when they submitted their application. So we would be happy to work with them and our development review team and get that language appropriate for when it goes to city council. It probably needs to be worded um, so that it meets the unified development ordinance standards, but we can certainly do that. And we would make sure that transportation is involved to be sure that the driveway. We don't need 60 days? No, I, not for a berm, not for a vegetative type buffer or berm. We've taken vegetative buffers in the past without a 60 day continuance. Okay. So we have UDA standards that address those. So tell me where the berm goes in relationship to the 20 foot wide buffer. Because that's not shown on the map either, although there is a text commitment to that. Are these separate facilities or is the one inside the other? So I'm trying to recall the 20 foot buffer. Um, the berm. Don't, don't worry about the buzzer, you can okay. continue. <laughs> didn't even well, that was for me. Oh. So, <laughs> so along Farrington Road on the, on the side of the maintenance facility, we're including a um, allocated space for a bike lane, allocated space for a sidewalk, and then outside of that space for the sidewalk, we have vegetative buffer and a berm that rises up towards the maintenance facility. I appreciate that, but I'm trying to understand how these facilities are stacked. Sure. Is the berm in the buffer? A, a, a berm, if it's going to be yes. eight to 10 yes. feet tall, is going to have- Yes, it's within base. the buffer. It's in the buffer. All right. And the other, and I'm going to ask one other question. I'm done. Uh, I'm very concerned about your ability to build an attractive building with your materials list. And we talked about this yesterday, and nobody has mentioned it. Your concrete, steel, and glass. I mean, is, that's a pretty limited materials list. Can you build the kind of building that these folks want to live nearby without bricks and without other materials? I mean, I look at the, you showed me the Charlotte facilities brick clad. Right, it's an excellent question. Um, one of the things we heard from the community is they were not interested in seeing the building in addition to hearing or smelling it. So trying to be good stewards of the public's money, we are not de designing a signature maintenance facility. We're designing a functional building that looks presentable and it looks attractive. We're proposing it's a precast concrete panels on the building. Um, the inside structure is steel to support the panels. There is glass uh, glazing windows to let light in. It's an attractive structure um, that we would be proud of building uh, for the community. But we did not hear from the community that they wanted to see the structure. So we did not feel it in, important to us to spend the public's money on something that is more of a maintenance function and not an enhancement aesthetically to the community. Well, let me ask you this. It's a 40% opacity buffer. That means when the plantings you put there mature, 40% of the view through the buffer will be occluded. 60% will be open. You will see the building. I, your statements seem to be inconsistent. Sure. But that's, it's not a question. That's a statement. 
Uh, then finally, have you met with these neighbors since you filed this petition for rezoning? No. No. I, I, I've asked them. We have not. Okay, thank you. We've not had a public meeting. Okay, well, thank you. All right, we're at the point where we are going to have a few follow-ups, and then we will we will then have a motion and have a vote this evening. So, Commissioner Williams, Commissioner Al Turk, could, could I answer uh, Commissioner Miller for a second? Uh, one second, Ms. Smith. May May I just I wanted to follow back up with Mr. Miller's um, statement about the buffer and the berm. You may. We would that would be a language that could be added to text commitment 13 to clarify exactly what they're going to plant within that buffer, and we will work with them on that and make sure that's secured as far as the berm goes. But I wanted to make sure that you knew that it was it would have to be done within the realm of that text commitment. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. And I don't, Commissioner Miller, did you have any additional questions for the no, proponents? I have, I have no other questions. Okay, we're going we're gonna to move okay. on then. Com you. Commissioner Williams? Uh, um, it just hasn't been much that I've heard that puts me in favor of this project. Um, even gaining new information as far as lighting and the berm is concerned. I mean, an eight-foot berm is the typical finished floor to finished ceiling height of a residential property, so that's not going to help much as far as sound traveling. Um, I just have not learned a lot, but I do know that the information that the engineer gave, I feel confident had that been given to the residents, they may have had a better understanding of what they're expecting. So I also feel confident in knowing that that probably didn't happen. Um, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not in favor of this project, so. Thank you. Commissioner Al-Turk. Thank you. Um, for the applicant, is there urgency in getting this approved now? I, we've heard from some that said, you know, what if this doesn't go through light rail and... Um, actually, quite frankly, it is extremely urgent to get this approval at this stage for a number of reasons. Um, and my colleagues can chime in if, if I've missed any of them. <laughs> um, for one reason, the Federal Transit Administration, uh, this is a highly competitive grant program with the FTA. They have numerous applicants all over the country that are competing for this funding. The FTA has noted that by the end of this year, there are um, at least a dozen critical agreements that Go Triangle has to have executed in order to keep, keep on schedule for a full funding grant agreement by September of next year. And the maintenance facility location has been mentioned. This is really based on the studies that have done over, been done over the last almost 10 years. This is the site that has been located that is viable. We don't have another viable site for the maintenance facility. We do not have a, an opportunity to go out and start that process all over again. We will not be on schedule to meet the FTA's deadline for $1.2 billion in funding from the federal government if we start this process again. At the end of this month, the FTA will institute what's called a risk assessment on the project. The FTA comes to our office in Durham along with their consultant team for a one-week workshop. And during that workshop, they scrutinize this project from top to bottom and identify the risks to the project before they're ready to continue investing over a billion dollars. One of the risks to the project that they recognize is the location for the maintenance facility. That is why Go Triangle has, there was a question earlier about why are we pushing this to be approved now when we don't have federal funding. The answer to that question is, we have to satisfy the FTA's guidelines and their concerns with the risk to the project. If we don't have this site approved, that jeopardizes over a billion dollars in federal funding because we would not meet the schedule. The um, requirements in the risk assessment will assess whether we've achieved acceptance for this maintenance facility site, and if we, had, if we do not, the FTA will be applying additional contingency funds to the project, which will um, inflate the cost of the project to the whole community. 
So this is extremely important to the project, the success of the project, to stay on schedule. As you may be aware, the state legislature instituted additional um, schedule constraints on the project. We have to have all of the non-federal, non-state funding committed by April of next year. We have to have all of the federal funding and have a, uh, an FFGA by November of next year. And, and if that does not happen, we lose $190 million that the state is willing to invest in the project. So due to the cost constraints, the schedule constraints, and the guidelines that the FTA has imported on the project, this is import extremely important to the success of the project and the viability of the project to get $1.2 billion in federal funding and the success of the project for transportation for the Orange and Durham County residents. Great, thank you. Any follow-up questions or comments, Commissioner Alturk? Well, I'm, I'm glad that the uh, final say on this is not in my hands, that it's the City Council, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your uh, th this is probably a good point to remind folks, we are an advisory body, so we will vote this evening, and even if we, if we will make a motion in the affirmative, but then you can vote for or against, regardless of whether we vote in favor or opposed, it will go forward to the City Council in two cycles, in, in December at some point. Uh, I will say from my personal standpoint, I appreciate everyone's time. I am persuaded this is this is the best site, even though I'm not, I am concerned about some of the limitations. I am going to vote tonight to send it forward to the City Council, but I do hope in the next 60 days that we do have dialogue, better dialogue with the community, yeah. that we are able to bring forward additional potential commitments that address some of the very valid concerns that we've heard raised here this evening. And I think there's enough time to be able to do that to truly be a good neighbor. Uh, but I do appreciate the time that the citizens, all of you who came, who spoke tonight and who have written us, I think you've raised valid concerns that I hope will be addressed in the next 60 days. Uh, with that, I will look for a motion. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Vice Chair Hyman. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, make a motion that we send case number, uh, and we do both of these numbers together. Uh, we will actually do individually. Okay. Uh, case number A1800003, forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. All right, so that is moved and seconded and again. We will then have a roll call vote on the motion. The motions are always made in the affirmative. No more outbursts, please. A roll call vote, please. Commissioner Alturk. No. Commissioner Durkin. Yes. Commissioner Hyman. No. Commissioner Busby. Yes. Commissioner Miller. No. Commissioner Kinchin. Yes. Commissioner Gibbs. Yes. Commissioner Williams. No. Oh, wow. It's a, actually, it's a tie. And it fails. Yeah. So a tie, the motion fails. We will now move to, again, that will still move forward, but with an unfavorable recommendation. We'll move to the zoning case. Yes, I'd like to make a motion that we send case number Z1800006 forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Moved by Vice Chair Hyman, seconded by Commissioner Miller. We'll have a roll call vote on this as well. Okay. Commissioner Alturk? No. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? No. Commissioner Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Kinchin? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Commissioner Williams? No. Again, the vote was 4-4. Four, four. We're double-checking the um, rules of procedure on the vote. Just We'll get right. So, actually, when you have a tie, the rules of procedure call that, that, that the motion fails. Yes. Just make sure that everybody, we want to double-check that because it doesn't ever happen. So. Yes. Yeah, this, this is rare that we have ties here. We have a few folks who were excused, and we had a recusal. But a tie means that the motion fails. But again, this will go forward to the city council. Each of us write comments that the council members can read. I know you will all stay engaged, and I hope you will, because our council members are listening very carefully on this issue as well. 
Again, I thank you for your time. We're going to take a five-minute break. I know a lot of you are going to head out, so thank you again. Thank you. I'm not in fact. Oh, it was just today. I love her. Yeah. Literally this morning. I'm sorry I can't make it. Here are a bunch of questions I have about the yep. I hope we can ask them. I'm like, oh, that's not my job. No. Uh-uh. But, no. This was, everybody, needs, all got to ask. everybody yeah. needs to be here. Yeah. All right. Why don't we get going? Well, that's it. That's it. Well, and I and I at the end of the day, I thought I should vote no to at least. Yeah. Well, not that like my. Two hundred years, three hundred years, to value. Everybody talks about Booker and Bowie, Eastgate. Yep. That's what. Oh yeah, Eastgate totally. Yeah. They just come to one place, down Cleveland, cross the golf course, into the core weapons. Now I have called five different core offices: the weapons office, the dam, back to Raleigh, two offices. I spent a hundred months. If you talk about it, I can clean that sand. I spent a hundred months. Yeah, you missed a very exciting one. Yeah. But nothing has been done about evaluating the ability of the four weapons to assimilate the storm. Who's going to pay for that? Because every time I go 
Coach Jekyll Hill, well, if I do Dark Bound, we're in the Durham County. Yeah. Well, folks, you're good. I got your name right. I couldn't read it for the life of me. That's all I was thinking about. Um, One of these days, we're going to be on the same side. Yeah. That's <laughs> a very fair point. That day, I think everything might freeze. <laughs> no, but I understand. Yeah, I understand. I absolutely understand. But, um, I Not tonight. Yeah. yeah. I want to say thank you for being so Oh, yeah. It's not easy, right? Yeah. This is what we do. You guys got a little work to do. Yeah. No, it's in council, man. They're making their decision. Oh, man, you, uh, it's like we really don't I remember what you said. You just needed a book. There is no challenge. Yeah, that's I don't, I, I'm, I don't know who to call. Let me go for uh, Chair Busby clears the uh, gallery. Yeah, thank you. I'll write a letter. Somebody needs to do a major study. What can that represent? Yeah. Let's go with us. Okay. We are going to reconvene. And we still have three cases before us this evening. So for those of you that have waited, I appreciate your time. Our next case is the case Z170021. This is the Shell Oil gas station. Oh, yeah. And we're just going to go ahead and get started with the staff report. I know folks will be back in a moment. And actually, we have, the, we have a quorum in the room, so... You, you may proceed when you're ready with the staff report. Sure. Thank you. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number Z170021. It is the Shell Oil gas station site. The applicant is Ash Miller of MLA Design Group. The subject site is 1102 NC54. It's presently split zoned. The, app the applicant proposes to change a 0.65 acre portion of the property, which is residential suburban uh, 20, and um, 1.35 acres of the office and institutional zone to commercial neighborhood with a development plan. The site is 2.879 acres. The development plan associated with this request proposes an expansion of the existing gas station, which will allow for a total of eight fueling positions and a pay station building. The property, the property is designated commercial and office on the future land use map. There's no change to the office designation. The commercial designation is consistent with the rezoning request. This is the aerial map. It shows the property in red and it fronts at the corner of Barbie Road and NC54. The subject site is located within the suburban development tier, the Cape Fear River Basin, and the Falls Jordan District watershed, um, as well as the MTC um, I-40 overlay district. These uh, pictures depict some of the existing conditions on the property. There's the existing gas station, um, and you can see um, the wooded, uh, heavily wooded portion of the site in the background. Um, the photos within the staff report and shown on these slides depict some of the uh, area conditions. The site is adjacent to the meadows at Southport, residential development to the east, 
and the south, the South Point Towns residential development to the north along NC-54 and a vacant um, lot to the west. The property is um, diagonally across from the NC-54 site that just received a planning commission recommendation uh, for zoning to allow for a maximum of 110 townhouse units. Um, the mat that matter is uh, currently scheduled for the November 19th, 2018 um, City Council hearing. Uh, other nearby uses um, include the Greens uh, at Pine Glen residential development, cell tower to the northwest, the Seasons at South Point, memory care community, um, and other residential developments, as well as a, a site plan that was or a site that was approved for self storage uh, nearby. In terms of the zoning on the left, you'll see the existing zoning with the property um, split between the RS20 and the OI zoning district. And on the right, you can see the portion that's shaded in a beigey color um, is the portion that is um, proposed to change to the commercial neighborhood with a development plan. There's no change to that real, real, uh, the rear portion um, of the office and institutional where no development is proposed. This is the future land use map, and you can see that it is also split um, flommed. The front portion is commercial. That's consistent with where the rezoning is proposed, and there's no change to the office. In terms of um, some of the proposed conditions, there's a maximum impervious coverage of 15% on the lot. The um, development plan provides minimum street yard, side yard, rear yard requirements, uh, fueling pumps, will be at least 15 um, feet uh, from the property line. And um, summary of some of the key committed elements, there's a uh, limitation to the use um, of the site uh, for fuel sales, a stipulation of a max of eight fueling positions, um, dedicated additional right of way along Barbie Road and NC 54 uh, for um, various roadway improvements. Um, Additional um, graphic commitments uh, specifically show the uh, location of the payload, the fueling stations, um, and site access points, and a commitment relative to the building materials for the pay station. In terms of um, relationship to comprehensive plan policies, the proposed CN zoning district complies with the current zoning, uh, I'm sorry, current commercial designation on the future land use map. They're consistent with 231A as the proposed rezoning seeks to eliminate an existing non-conforming designation and it seeks to enhance an existing development. Um, the development plan addresses some of the existing site conditions uh, and also seeks to improve the existing deteriorating building. Um, the existing infrastructure such as roads, water and sewer are sufficient to accommodate the potential impacts. Um, since the increase in capacity from the proposed zoning trips is less than 3% of the overall capacity of NC-54 and it remains below 120%, the proposed um, rezoning is consistent with 812H. Uh, the proposed development is consistent with policy 814D as the development co plan commits to additional asphalt um, for a future bike lane on the south side of NC-54. And the um, proposed development is consistent with 1111B uh, since the proposed zoning will decrease the number of students uh, generated compared to the current zoning. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances. And I will be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We're going to open the public hearing, and we have two individuals signed up to speak in favor, Daniel Dinsbeer and Scott Miller, and you'll have 10 minutes total if you need it. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to come and present to you. I'm just glad we weren't the last case, to be honest with you. <laughs> Feel for y'all guys. Uh, I just want to thank the uh, the planning staff, Jamie Sunyak in, in particular, Bill Judge has helped us 
uh, uh, quite a bit in the transportation uh, NCDOT along with him uh, in uh, helping us develop this plan. We started this process a couple years ago of, uh, of trying to you know determine how do we improve our situation. It's a, it's a tough intersection. And so uh, with the help of uh, the staff bill, NCDOT, we think we've come up with a, a really good plan that's going to improve the situation quite a bit out there. And uh, so uh, and it's been a long night. Uh, Scott Miller is uh, our landscape architect and civil engineer, and uh, is, uh, we're available to answer any questions that you uh, may have. And, and just uh, we could go from there. That's great. Thank you. And you're welcome. You're signed up as well. You're welcome to speak. For, for reference purposes or specific questions you might have. Great, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on this issue? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing. Commissioners, any questions or comments? Commissioner Alturk? Thank you, Chair. Um, so right now there are four, four fueling positions? Okay, and so you're wanting to expand it to eight, is that correct? And where would these go? Because I don't think I see exactly where they would go in the... So what if you were able to see the site right now, our current canopy is actually, the front of our canopy will line up with the 35 foot of right of way that we're giving to the, uh, to, to, to the city, I guess it would be. If, I don't know if that's exactly correct. And then what, so we're gonna move our whole site back off the road. So our, our entrance right now is just right. 50 foot right. off of Barbie and at the intersection of Barbie and 54. Right. So we're moving our entrance down 80 more foot down to nor near the edge of our property to get it as far away as we possibly can. And then it, and we're putting a right hand turn lane in that will allow stacking. So those four, those fueling positions will be 30 foot. I think it's about 30 foot behind the new right. So in the lineup parallel to uh, North Carolina Highway 54. Okay, great. Now, is there an actual commitment in here to have a maximum of eight fueling positions or no? I think that zoning is a maximum of eight, but. Um, Jamie Sonyak, so if you look at the development plan sheet too, it does show the areas where the fueling positions are located. Right. Um, they're sort of in a rectangular box. Yeah. Um, and there is a, uh, there is language regarding um, the max of eight fueling positions and that is the max within the zoning district. I see. Okay. So there is a text commitment that says maximum of eight fueling positions somewhere. I, I guess it's I it's under the site plan data on DP twelve. I'm sorry, DP two. DP two. Okay. Great. And it's it's not listed specifically as a text commitment. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and why did you go with the CN designation? I mean that. In the UDO, it says that this should be something that is not automotive, automotive oriented. That is, you know, for commercial, for the residential uses nearby for the neighborhood. And so it, it strikes me as kind of odd that we're trying to rezone this as CN I, I the think, development plan. I think the best answer is it's a maximum of eight fueling positions, and a commercial would allow more. And we were trying to be restrictive out of, out of respect to the neighborhood. Okay. Thank you. Additional questions or comments from commissioners? Commissioner Kenshin? Uh, I'm, I'm going to vote yes. Um, I live near there and I drive past every single day almost, probably at least one time. And cars are always stacked on 54 trying to pull in. And it's very dangerous. So I'm excited to see that get improved. Uh, I've been worried about that for a long time. So it's going to be a big help for the neighborhood. So thank you. We, we think it's going to be a vast improvement to the current conditions that, that are there. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. When I first heard this was coming, I had concerns. And then when I saw the plan and saw the traffic improvements and to see the comprehensive look at all the other uh, development sites, because we've had many of them come through here, which I, I appreciate the staff report addressing it, I felt much more comfortable and confident. And I, I think it will help at that intersection because it's a pretty tough intersection. I think that'll help ease some of the traffic issues. And, and again, I, I really have to give Bill and uh, Jamie a, a lot of credit for helping guide us through the situation. Uh, we started off not being so generous <laughs> and giving right away, and we wanted something. And they and they really they really helped guide us into this situation where this to make it a better plan for for the uh, 
for the residents, safety, everything. So, uh, so, so, and, and we, you know, you typically don't enjoy a process. It's very difficult because you're having to. It's a give and take, but it, we we do we do really appreciate it. We, you know, it's helped us out. So. Well, thank you. And any additional questions or comments, Commissioner Williams? I just want to say thank you. Um, I'm a lifer from that area, and the gas house has always been a staple. So watching people try to turn in there and showing that you have a dedicated right turn lane into it is immensely helpful. And I was also concerned as to how this was going to expand, given the amount of uh, land drop off that you have just to the right of the gas house. So um, I'm very impressed by what has taken place here. Seeing no additional questions or comments, we could make a motion for approval. I think you just did, Mr. Chairman. I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will. L let me do it officially then. I will uh, move that we approve case Z17000021. This is the Shell Oil one, gas two. station. No, oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong one. Two one. You're exactly right. I second it. Okay, great. <laughs> Motion made by me, seconded by Commissioner Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 She wants to have a roll call vote. You'd rather have a roll call? Okay, we'll have a roll call then. Um, Commissioner Altur. Yes. Commissioner um, Baker. Yes. Commissioner Durkin. Yes. Commissioner Hyman. Yes. Commissioner Busby. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner Kinchin. Yes. Commissioner Gibbs. Yes. Commissioner Williams. Yes. It's unanimous, 9-0, passes. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate you waiting. We next have case Z18-00012. This is West Point at 751 revisions. We'll start with the staff report. Thank you. Good evening, Jamie Sanyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number Z180012. This is West Point at 751 revisions uh, number four. The applicant is Robert Schonk of Stewart, Inc. Um, the location is um, on the west side of NC uh, 751 south of Interstate 40. The site is 17, a total site is 17.3 six acres. Um, the property is located within the city's jurisdiction. Um, just as background, there was a legacy case that was approved by council with a zoning map change and development plan for this uh, area on April 4th, 2016. It's legacy case Z150027. This is the aerial map and the subject um, site is shown you know, highlighted in red. The staff report had a different location, so it's been corrected. Um, again, this is the um, site uh, with the current zoning. It's um, commercial center with a development plan. Um, as part of the previous development plan, it stipulated a maximum of 120,000 square feet of office, 16,900 square feet of retail, um, 16,000 square feet of uh, residential use, and a hotel of 271 rooms. And this is um, the proposed condition. The applicant is requesting some minor revisions to the tax commitments. Um, the first is to add medical office and hospital as additional uses to PID 213146, which is the building envelope B uh, that is shown in, um, in sort of the white color there. Uh, the step, the second is to stipulate no south facing uh, building signage except on buildings in building envelope uh, B and building envelope D, which is uh, directly adjacent to that. The orientation of this map is sort of sideways. Um, so you're looking north would be to your right. There's no other uh, cho changes proposed to the rest of the approved um, development plan, but per text amendments, um, per 
uh, specifically related to text amendments per the Unified Development Ordinance. Um, any revision to committed elements are considered a significant change and would require a new hearing and recommendation from the Planning Commission um, before being considered by a city council. Uh, this uh, slide just highlights the text amendments, which I've already described. Um, staff uh, reviewed the proposed changes and determined um, that they're consistent with the UDO requirements, um, as well as the comprehensive plan and other um, adopted ordinances and um, policies. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. We're going to open the public hearing. We have two individuals signed up. We have uh, Robert Schunk signed up to speak for and Ketan Shaw to, and I, I love this, so let me just say I appreciate this, for but with conditions or restrictions. So uh, each of you will have um, up to 10 minutes, I guess, per side. Please don't use that much time. <laughs> Go ahead. Use it. I certainly will not. Uh, Robert Schunk, uh, 2627 University Drive here in Durham. Um, very briefly, we started this, we first zoned this project in uh, 2008. Uh, this building envelope was proposed to, was proposed to have a hotel. Uh, they didn't want to have a second hotel, so we added an office in 2012, and or maybe th I think in 2015. And now uh, a client here with me tonight looking to do a medical office building with some surgery, um, a surgery center with inside of it. So that's what we're here for. Um, again, and also to allow some south-facing signage on that building as well for vis better visibility from the entrance. Um, all the other applicable ordinance uh, re regulations are being followed, uh, you know, parking and buffers and everything else associated with the UDO. I'm here for any questions you might have. Thank you. And Ket and Shaw. Well, my name is uh, Caitlin Shaw. I uh, own the property adjoining to this uh, site, 7806 and C751. The few concerns I've had uh, related to this uh, rezoning case have been satisfied by the, the, the client of this person, Robert. So I, I, I'm in favor for it. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your time. Anyone else who would like to speak? We're going to close the public hearing. Commissioners, any questions or comments on this case? I think we love a happy ending, so this is great that you've been able to work out your, your issues. If there are no questions or comments, we'll take a motion for approval. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve Z1800012, excuse me, I move that we send it forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. All right, moved and seconded. We will have a roll call vote for approval. Commissioner Alchart? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Kuchin? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. And it passes 9 0. Um, I hate to inform you, but we're going to have to backtrack to the last item. Um, I think because of the late hour and staff's a little tired. We um, failed to um, inform you that the chair cannot make a motion. So I, we need to redo that vote. The, the okay. chair um, made the motion, and okay. that's not allowable. So. Well, consonant with the advice that we received from the chair, I move that we approve, I mean, that we send case 01700214 to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Properly moved and seconded. We'll have a... <laughs> Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, good. Thank you. Passes 9 0. Great, thank you. Thank you for catching that. I apologize for. That's all right. Thank you all. We have one final case in front of us. This is uh, the Unified Development Text Ordinance TC 18 quadruple zero two omnibus 12. Michael Stock has. Put in his time tonight. I, I was expecting to be here a little bit longer, so I brought a sleeping bag and my Snuggie um, to, to sleep under my desk. But We're not done thankfully, yet. it 
wasn't that long. Let me um, pull up my wonderful slideshow, and I emphasize wonderful. Um, or emphasize slideshow. So I wanted to, um, again, my name is Michael Stock with the plan, uh, the plan department. Um, TC 180002 uh, is one of the favorites of our mayor, omnibus text amendments. Um, he loves omnibus text amendments. He, um, so, um, but I also wanted to present you with just a quick rundown of the quick hits within it. Doesn't mean that I'm looking to specifically overlook anything. I'm sorry? I'm sorry. Or I'll click that button. There we go. Um, but I wanted to go over some quick hits with it, um, points that we thought were were important to point point out, and then of course I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding any any of it. Is not meant to uh, slight any of the provisions that are being proposed. Um, so general highlights, then go over uh, the MPO process revisions, and then everybody's favorite mailbox clusters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the first uh, first uh, highlight we wanted to uh, identify was uh, changes to uh, neighborhood notification. Um, we're in the 21st century, so we can do emails uh, at a lot and, and do notification a lot better than when we were first doing neighborhood notifications way back before we even had the UDO. Um, it's not, um, so as, as indicated, uh, this neighborhood notification for public hearings was a policy prior to the adoption of the UDO and then it was codified with the UDO. It's not a statutory requirement. Um, and in order to receive notification, whether you're an entity, organization, or just uh, Tom Miller who wants to hear about everything, um, uh, you just register with the department and it's free. Um, and we, we maintain those lists uh, generally every two years unless somebody emails me and says, please take me off the list, which does happen. And we try to uh, agree with that. And then we get a bunch of bounce backs, too. So we do have to update it every once in a while. Uh, for most hearings, it's a 1,000-foot notification buffer. And then there's a letter that's sent out. Um, for plan or text amendments, it's email notification. Um, so the proposed revisions are to make an email notification for all. Um, and there will be no distance requirements. So if you're registered with us, you're going to be notified about every public hearing that's going on um, on at least a monthly basis. Uh, so, uh, it's, we feel it's more inclusive, uh, uh, no registered person or organization will be, feel left out. There have been times when, uh, folks were, were wondering why they didn't get notified. They were part of an organization, maybe they were part of a PAC or some other neighborhood organization or HOA, and why didn't they get notified by, about a certain zoning case or something, and we have to tell them, well, you're outside the thousand foot notification range. Um, so, and that's a legitimate answer, but this makes it more inclusive. If you're on the list, you get the notification. Um, it also simplifies the, the process, and it makes it actually a less expensive process because we don't have to print out things on paper and pay postage and that kind of thing, too. Um, we're also making some other changes. Uh, we're, we're making sure that there's consistency with notification distance requirements for for FLUM and text amendments, so we're not sending out one range of notification from one aspect of a project and a different range for another aspect of the project. Um, 600 feet is well beyond the minimum statutory requirements for zonings um, and, and comprehensive plan amendments. Uh, statutory requirements are adjacent properties. Um, and we are changing the MPO and historic district notifications uh, down to 100 feet because those are more unique type of zoning requests that are kind of inward facing or um, uh, it, it gets confusing when you're sending out to 600 feet beyond a historic district request or an MPO request and people are like, why are we getting, we have to send out two different types of letters generally. We still will have to send out a couple different types of letters, but it won't be as cumbersome or confusing. Uh, we are adjusting the infill revisions. We seem to visit them uh, we like to visit them every time we do Omnibus because we love that section. Um, uh, we're adding back in corner lot provisions that we took out last time. We thought the changes that we made last time were going to help with uh, corner lots, and we realized that the provisions we had in there previously work, and it's basically allowing 
uh, focusing uh, the provisions to where that, uh, uh, if you're developing on the lot, uh, the corner lot, it's a, a choice of the applicant of how they choose to um, uh, situate for street yards. And then if it's part of the context area, you're only counting the corner lot if it's the facing that subject block face. Uh, we're removing window provisions because they are pretty much in violation of design and aesthetic controls and they're kind of hard to regulate anyway. Um, and we are adding some on-site parking relief for narrow lots when they're in conflict with um, the required street yards because of infill. If you're, if you're pulling the building up closer to the, to the right of way, it's harder to position uh, uh, parking or driveways on there. So for narrower lots where you don't have the flexibility to, to locate the building side to side, uh, we're just saying you don't have to require the parking. Uh, Non-conforming lot revisions, uh, we're actually just reorganizing that for the most part. We are adding two provisions in there. One is that you can uh, create a non-conforming lot if you're alleviating other non-conformities, such as non-conforming uses. It's, we're saying that non-conforming uses is probably the worst of the non-conformities. Non-conforming lots isn't as bad. So if you're alleviating non-conforming uses or other non-conformities, um, then it's okay to uh, create a non-conforming lot. And we already allow that even for non-conforming lots. If you're making a situation better, you can still create a non-conforming lot. Um, and then we're also adding in, and this has been an interesting situation over the years. Our variance section is, says that you can seek a variance on lot dimensional standards, and yet our non-conforming lot section says you can't do that. So we're just adding in there, reiterating that, yes, you can seek a variance through the Board of Adjustment quasi-judicial hearing on a lot dimensional standard. So if there's something extremely unique about your development site or something that you need to create a non-conforming lot, you can seek it relief through the quasi-judicial process. And that's usually typical for most jurisdictions. It's a dimensional standard that you can seek. It's not a use. Um, changes for affordable housing bonus. We're clarifying how the height restrictions work for applying the affordable housing bonus in the S2 subdistricts of uh, design districts. It was just a confusion in wording and how it works. Uh, you get the maximum allowed uh, height if you are doing affordable housing, if you're implementing the affordable housing bonus. We're not looking to restrict the height if you're implementing that bonus. Um, we are, there was confusion about how the standards within the bonus section applied if you're in a compact neighborhood tier, and we just clarified that to, to meet the intent. Uh, we are increasing the bonus from a one-to-one -one bonus to a one-to-two bonus, basically, um, uh, for the suburban and urban tiers. That was a request by, um, a, a, from a number of different aspects to try to up that bonus allotment uh, since there hasn't been any takers on that at all. Um, we did that. We did a one-to-three in the compact neighborhood tier. And then it obviously has been changed, but there's been some interest in some affordable housing uh, in the suburban and urban tiers, and, they, and at least the um, folks that have met with our department, and I don't know if I'm getting this right or wrong, um, is that, that uh, the one-to-one -one is more of an offset than really any kind of bonus, and a one-to-two is actually getting you a bonus. Can you, can you tell me what page you're on? I'm sorry. Uh, I kind of got lost. I'm sorry. Do, 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 do one section. It is uh, page, uh, the top of page 10, where it's 663, six, six, Suburban and Urban Tiers. And additionally, we're also uh, adding language to make affordable housing units and market rate units even less distinguishable. Um, interior elements and such. Right, I read those. Yeah. Um, other notable, we think, revisions, um, uh, based upon direction from JCCPC, we're removing self-storage and allowed use in the downtown design district. It's already not an allowed use in the compact design district, so there will be a consistency with that. There are, there are a couple uh, uh, self-storage facilities downtown or in the process. Um, but um, we are removing that as an allowed use. Um, we are adding standards for little libraries um, and uh, uh, also called blessing boxes sometimes. Um, technically, our ordinance prohibits them 
because they're a fixed object and of, um, placed within yards. I don't know if we've had any specific complaints about it, but it was brought to our attention, so um, our director asked us to put in some nominal standards for them. Um, we're, we're deleting the additional findings for minor special use permits uh, for fence and walls. We're not deleting the requirement. Um, if you go through those findings, you'll see that they are redundant with the findings, um, the general findings. They are all, all addressed through, can be all addressed through the general findings. Whether the Board of Adjustment finds them adequately addressed, that's a different thing, but they can all be addressed through, through them. Um, we're adding mass grading buffers to the list of applicable areas uh, for, for the compact neighborhood tier. Um, since we've changed a number of areas, more suburban areas to compact neighborhood tiers, uh, currently the mass grading buffers don't apply within compact neighborhood tiers, and um, uh, we felt that that was necessary. We've seen some projects uh, come through that would, would that grading only projects that would have uh, benefited from some mass grading buffers, even if they are temporary in nature. Uh, we are limiting driveway widths. Basically, it's you, you can it sets a driveway width, and then it says you can go as wide as you want if you do a site plan or plot plan. So we're just getting rid of, we're setting, we're sticking to the limit of 25 feet wide, and this is for usually just houses and and uh, duplexes and such, but um, not allowing wider than 25 feet. Sticking with the limit that's there and taking away, except if shown on a site plan or plot plan. Um, we're adding some additional parameters to the edges of alternative streetscape plans uh, within design districts. And the really exciting one is adding a definition for massage therapy. Um, it's actually already in there, but it's kind of buried in with uh, uh, adult, <laughs> adult establishment and uh, uh, we're adjusting where the, the zoning that massage therapy, a reputable practice, um, uh, uh, it, it's getting its own listing in there. So I, I knew Commissioner Mill would be excited about that. Um, you buried your lead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, I preferred it kind of blurred. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, neighborhood protection overlay. Uh, we are part of this, um, and, and something that we agreed and. Quite honestly, we, we didn't have to necessarily commit to agreeing to it because we were going to do it anyways. When Old West Durham neighborhood protection overlay process went through its thing, we generally, as a good standard practice, is evaluate how it went. And um, part of that is taking a look at the process. And since there was a big gap between Tuscaloosa Lakewood that happened in 2007 and uh, uh, Old West Durham, which happened in 2018, we haven't really taken a look at the processes, uh, at taken a hard look. So when Old West Durham went through, it gave us an opportunity to see how things worked or didn't work. Um, the current MPO initiation process, so, so what we're changing is the initiation process um, at this point. Um, currently, a, a neighborhood would submit an application, for lack of a better term, or you can just call it a petition to do an MPO. Um, and one thing, I left it in there because this is what we talked about at JCCPC. Uh, there, are, there are persons in there concerned about having 100% or a majority percent uh, support for, uh, or some specific number percent support for an MPO, was that none of them ever had a 100% property owner signature. Um, uh, so those applications get submitted with the department, we forward them on to JCCPC for their review and then they prioritize them and prioritize is kind of a wonky term if there's one um, it's either, yeah, we kind of like you to move forward with it, prioritizing it or some other uh, thing, or, or we don't like it and, and we're not going to prioritize it. Um, then after that, it kind of gets worked in with the, the work program that the department works with through JCCPC and then ultimately approved by uh, the governing body. So that's how it gets kind of initiated by the city city council or board of commissioners if it happens to be in the county, is that they, they assign the work program item as a priority, like do this now kind of thing, versus it kind of being down on the list of things to do. Um, right now the proposed revisions are just to clearly indicate that the governing body is the final authority to initiate the rezoning. Um, and that's in line with actually historic districts where we take someone's 
wants to do an historic lo local historic district, and it ultimately goes through a process, gets a recommendation from the HPC, and um, gets a recommendation from the HPC, and then it goes to uh, the governing body, city council, and they say, yes, go and do it. We initiate this, this rezoning. Um, we're keeping JCCPC in the loop, and they'll make the, they'll make a recommendation. So they'll review the rec uh, review the applications um, before it gets to the governing body, and there will be notifications that go out for both of those meetings. They're not public hearings, but we one of the things that we heard through the process was that you know this whole initiation process kind of happened without anybody really knowing about it, or very few people knowing about it, such as just the applicants and such. So we will do notifications. Uh, consistent with what you would do for a rezoning um, to make sure people are aware that people are talking about it and seeking uh, seeking an in initiation on it. If there is a fee, we will charge a fee for just the notification. There is no proposed uh, adjustment to the fee schedule at this time that I'm aware of, but it leaves op the, open, the option open to charge a fee for at least just the notification requirements. Um, we are also clarifying it's it's required, but it's not um, uh, intuitively into that section that a pre-submittal meeting before you submit an initiation request, uh, you have that with staff, um, that you have a neighborhood meeting before you submit the initiation request. Um, we have taken a lot of the guideline guidelines that have been reviewed by JCCPC and just codified them. Um, there are minimum guidelines. Um, there is still some information that needs documents that need to be provided that demonstrate neighborhood support. So a petition can be submitted, but we're not putting a, a hard number on that petition. Um, we heard pretty loud and clear from JCCPC that they did not want to hear. They wanted to take it on a case by case basis, depending upon the neighborhood. Um, detail the regulatory aspects that current couldn't currently be addressed through the base zoning. Um, any suggested modified list of standards, that stuff changes as you go through the process, but at least get the neighborhood thinking about what they want to do. Um, and then maintaining mass and scale uh, possible design guidelines, but other aesthetic guidelines, because generally with single family, uh, unless you're in a historic district, you can't do aesthetic controls, um, even with an MPO. And then cluster box units. If you did not know, uh, the United States Postal Service will not do house to house uh, mailboxes for new subdivisions anymore. So you'll go into, if you drive into a friend's uh, very brand new, spanking new house, and you see, wow, they have some cluster boxes, kind of like you'd see at townhomes or something, it's because the United States Postal Service mandates that now. So we've uh, proposed some minimum standards. We've taken a look at what other jurisdictions have done, and uh, they're pretty nominal. Um, there, there had to be some uh, handicap accessible parking spaces that go along with these. Um, we've added in ma mandating pedestrian connectivity to them, incorporating them within the development so you can actually walk to them and not have to walk along a road um, or a large driveway. Um, and also not be punitive in terms of since this is mandated, these are nominal things, and they're usually clustered around and a lot of times even put at a community center if there's going to be a community center there, um, but not count against our open space requirements. We're not looking to be punitive that way. They're going to get hit with some stormwater impervious surface standards no matter what, but not to be uh, hit them with, hit the developers with counting against our open space requirements. And that's all I have. Be happy to answer any questions or take down notes for any suggested suggestions. Great, thank you. Why don't we actually have two individuals signed up for the public hearing? So why don't we open the public hearing? We can we can hear the testimony, and then we may. I'm sure we have questions for you afterwards. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one individual in favor, one individual against. Uh, so we'll start with the the individual in favor, Robert Shunk, and then Ellen Pless against. Each, each side has 10 minutes if you so will not take them. Uh, I'll admit to staff I'm bad about keeping up with these text amendment changes and sometimes see them late and 
but uh, I was making a comment about uh, increasing the percentage of the uh, two unit townhomes a little bit higher than a 20%, at least in the urban tier in the uh, compact neighborhoods to have a lot more flexibility within like a project like, like Pinecrest or you know other similar tight sites. And that was the only comment I had. Great. Thank you. Ms. Pless, you get to be the final public speaker this evening. Thank you for waiting this long to share no, your thoughts. No, I'm impressed that all of you have the stamina to do this. Um, I don't know if this is your normal running time, but if it is, I'm very impressed as a taxpayer. Uh, <laughs> my name is Ellen Pless. I live at 706 East Forest Hills Boulevard in the Forest Hills neighborhood in Durham. Um, as you know, we currently have an NPO, which is in process and was prioritized by JCCPC back on August 1st. At that time, I had the opportunity to read quite a bit of the language that was being proposed under Omnibus Changes 12 as it was going before the JCCPC. And I'm, I guess I, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask a question, but I might be looking for a bit of clarification uh, because a great deal of the language that I'm seeing in this version of Omnibus Changes 12 appears to be rather different from that which I was viewing prior to the JCCPC. I noticed um, at that point there was talk about you know, retroactive dating uh, going back to the uh, 1st of January 2018. I no longer see that language in here. Right, that was based upon the discussion at JCCPC. We took that language out. That language was removed. Okay, very good. Um, I also basically just appear in, appearing in front of you all, I'm not a very good public speaker. I do apologize. Um, I wish to try and drive home, though, that the NPO as it exists is really the only citizen-led tool that is currently written into our UDO. And as such, it's actually really important. Uh, I don't need to tell you that Durham is growing like crazy. Obviously, you know that. That's your job. Um, mm -hmm. We citizens oftentimes do not feel empowered with the kind of growth that's happening in our community. The NPO is an incredibly important tool made available to us. And I would ask that any changes that are made or written into the uh, rules for NPOs carefully consider that that tool needs to remain easily accessible to our neighborhoods. My neighborhood was able to organize and pull together and try to put forward a good NPO application. I can tell you it was an immense amount of work. It did not happen quickly. It did not happen easily. We held many of the meetings that were recommended in the slides that you saw just a moment ago. Um, it is not easy to try and protect your neighborhood. We're still working toward that, as you heard earlier tonight with the Flum Amendment and everything else. Currently, we have 16 months remaining on our current NPO application, and we eagerly await and look forward to engaging actively with the planning uh, staff to work productively on that application. Um, that having been said, I really simply want for people to realize the importance of remaining, uh, keeping the NPOs available to all different neighborhoods within Durham not politicizing the process too early on. By doing so, I fear that you remove the process from the hands of the average citizen. Um, please keep the NPO device easily available to your citizenry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. And I would disagree with your assessment of your public speaking skills. You're yeah, an excellent, you <laughs> excellent public speaker. Thank you for your time. Anyone else who'd like to speak? Seeing literally no one except staff and commissioners, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Commissioners, questions, comments? We'll start on the left, oh, we'll Commissioner Williams. Yes, um, I have a question as far as the blessing boxes or mini libraries, I think they're called. Are there design requirements for those to be constructed? Do they have to meet a minimum standard or maximum? There, there's, there's no building code requirements for them. Mm -hmm that I'm aware of. So they couldn't be like a little she shed on the curb? They could be a little she shed on the curb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, there, there are some minimum, there's maximum size. Gotcha. So it, and I went online just to kind of check out what some standard sizes are and, and uh, they're, not that yeah, they're pretty consistent with what you see in, in different neighborhoods. There's one in my neighborhood now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my other, yeah. they're not happening, yeah. 
Um, my other statement is um, to the young lady that just spoke, and I 100% agree with you when it comes to the NPO. And that is exactly what I feel like it should be for and how it should remain. And if not, be an easier process, if possible. Thank you, Commissioner Williams. Commissioner Miller? I have a bunch of questions. So I'm on page eight, and we're adding vertical integration of uses in suburban and urban tiers. Uh, give me an example of what you, uh, with the invert, a vertical integration of uh, different uses in, in these tiers. The zoning districts, like such as um, any of those zoning districts, commercial zoning districts, or a mixed use district that allows residential and commercial um, could be an integrated vertical integration. So right, it, rather it's, than not, it's, them, not, it's not rather adding than a requirement. It's not requiring them to be side by side. Right, right. Um, mixed use district, you could do a horizontal or a vertical integration, there's allowed for both, and there's no uh, restriction um, besides the technical dimensional standards for some of the other zoning districts that would prohibit a vertical integration versus a side by side. So it was just an, something that it's not adding an allowance, it's just this section happens to recognize allowances as a table. So it was seen. So I'm on page out. nine, and it's two other zoning districts B. I don't understand the change. I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? I didn't catch So it. if you'll go to page nine. Yes, I'm there. And on, down where it says two other zoning districts, you make a change to B. You strike out what was there, and you, I don't understand the difference. Oh, okay. Um, it was just clear wording. It's not. It's it's not changing the standard. It's just instead of saying produce should not permit housing types not already. It's like can utilize only the housing types. It's more in the affirmative than in the negative. Mm -hmm. Actually, when we do regulatory drafting, we prefer the negative. Well, this one <laughs> we try we try to make it as user friendly as possible. Okay, I appreciate it. Um, on page eleven. And you have a change there to 685A2, and it says prohibits compliance to the minimum dimension. And it, should it be compliance with or to? I'm, I found that grammar a little unusual. I will double check that. All right, thank you. And then uh, on page 12, um, down at the bottom, development standards 20%, uh, are we... Mr. Shunk was interested in, he told me that he was interested in 25%. Uh, he and I have actually had a debate about, about whether or not, what the risk is uh, about having two unit configurations in townhouse projects giving the, you know, the gravitational pull in most development projects is, to, is more units, not fewer. I don't see a lot of, uh, of risks uh, to, for going from 20% to 25%. I don't see a developer coming in and building 40 townhouses in two unit blocks. Correct. Um, we, in discussions that I've also had with uh, Mr. Shunk, he had indicated much higher percentages. Um, we, can't, we had come up with, when this was first proposed back, or discussed back in spring, um, we came up with this nominal number of 20%. Um, uh, because it was nominal, we didn't see a great impact. So one out of every five buildings would be a two unit, could be a two unit building. Okay, it allows some flexibility. 25% um, probably would be just as nominal, one out of every four. We're not opposed to that. Yeah. Um, I see it only happening in, in, as Mr. Shunk said, these constricted properties. And I'm really sensitive to the townhouse thing because we're working on the, sure. the Hill and Dale thing sure. where, the, where the property is really goofy with um, uh, riparian buffers. So. Correct. Um, jumping ahead. So in part eight, I have a lot of problems with this. So essentially we're declaring that only... I'm sorry, where, where are you again? Part eight, part, you're page 26. It's the NPO. Okay. Uh, I have some serious misgivings about the illegality of declaring at the ordinance level that only the city can initiate a certain type of rezoning. There is no statutory basis for that. There is a statutory basis for saying that 
for certain types of, of zoning like conditional zoning or, or even in the special legislation for our uh, development plan zoning that a certain class of people uh, can are eligible and, and other people are not eligible to, to ask for the rezoning. But this is a statewide legislative process and you're telling citizens that they can't apply for something. I think that's unlawful. Well, now you can have different standards for citizens who proceed two ways, but I don't think you can actually tell uh, have a rule that says that there's a type of zoning without a spe without a specific statutory power to do it that there is a category of zoning that somebody can't come in and apply for by themselves and not have it be city initiated in other words if I can pull all the the, the special expertise if I can hire Mr. Shunk and 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 uh, and Bill Bryan and and a bunch of other people and fashion all of the components of a neighborhood protection overlay and, and uh, apply for the text amendment and the map change and all those things, I think the, the state statute has to allow us to do that, even though it's not likely to occur. Now, if we want to have special uh, rules that say, if you're, going, if you're not going to do that, Mr. Citizen or Miss Citizen, and you want the city, city to do it for you, and you want the city to expend city resources to do it for you, here are the hoops you have to jump through. I think that's what you're getting at. And it's based upon the assumption that only, that's the only way it's really ever going to occur, and you may be right. But to declare right out that only the city can apply for an NPO, I don't think that's consistent with state law. And it also certainly isn't consistent with the ordinances that I've, the uh, neighborhood conservation overlay ordinances I've read in uh, from other cities. We spent a lot of time looking at those in the last year. Uh, so that is a big change here. And what I would like to do is, I don't re really have a problem with the rest of this, but I would like to pull section eight out of this and hold it uh, for a little while so that we, I can get some answers. Well, and, and I would actually ask if staff, I mean, you, you, Commissioner Miller, you've made an assertion, and I, I'm not sure that that's how I read this document, so I wanted to hear from staff, is, is that, the, the, is that the your way, understanding that this is how this would move forward? This is how it would move forward. Um, we have not heard concerns about this from our city or county attorney's office, um, but um, we will reiterate that concern with them and maybe uh, we all overlook something that you're catching. Um, so we'll take another look at it. I would hesitate to pull this out. And if it's, if on the advice of our city and county attorney's offices um, that it shouldn't move forward or should be revised, we'll do either pull it out or um, make the revision as necessary that you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. um, I just have a lot of problems with, with this. I think we go way beyond the 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 way rezonings are supposed to happen as they they are envisioned in our general statutes it's a le general legislative process uh, and all citizens stand on equal footing with legislative processes this is not a quasi-judicial process or anything like that this is a legislative process it I mean, I don't have a problem with going to the JCCPC and say, uh, here's what the citizens want the city to do. The, city, the citizens want the city to initiate a zone change. Uh, and then the JCCPC uh, it advises whether or not they think it's a good use of, of uh, the municipal and county resources. That doesn't bother me at all. Uh, and even establishing standards uh, for making that request. I do have a thing that, that to the point that it becomes exclusive. Um, I just think I, it's a problem. I, I understand your concerns, and we can definitely look into that. And if, um, and based upon what you say, if it's determined that that is exactly the case, that that is overstepping the bounds of the legislative authority, then we'll make the appropriate adjustments. Well, what, and the other thing is, too, is I don't think most of the people in the neighborhood community aware that that these changes are being proposed. I mean, they they could have gotten them, they could have followed them, you haven't kept them a secret. Uh, but you know, I quite frankly uh, wasn't following along with this either and was surprised when I got this in my packet last week and saw that these changes 
were as thoroughgoing as they now appear to be. So these were in, when I send out, when I things go to the JCCPC, I send out a review for you do. input. And you that, do. And all those were in there. They were. Uh, in there. I um, acknowledge that. The big that. change was the removal of the, um, that uh, retroactive date. Um, so that was removed. Um, and we did adjust some language about fees, so it's not mandatory. The way it was wording, it was kind of being read that it was going to mandate a fee, which was not the intent. So uh, as I reiterate, um, we will definitely... Uh, well, ask the city attorney and the county yeah, attorney. Yeah, I, we will not move forward with it. One other, one other point, though. Ask them also, you talk about guidelines. Um, Guidelines, we either have ordinances or we don't. That's have what ordinances. we're doing here. We're codifying those guidelines. Yeah, but you still refer to the possibility of there being guidelines. Uh, no, no, we're taking away those guidelines. We're taking away those aesthetic guideline rules. You can still do ordinance standards that are for massing and scale. We're not taking that away, but we're taking away language that talks about design guidelines. Well, no, it says the JCCPC will, shall be responsible for review and recommendation of the administrative guidelines. If the guidelines are mandatory, then the, then And the, that was an oversight of my not, what section are you reading that in? I'm in, on page 26, 2.2.3C. Mm -hmm. The JCCPC shall be responsible for review and recommendation. You've added and recommendation for administrative guidelines. We either we either have rules or we don't have rules, but guidelines that can be changed outside uh, the ordinance making process, in my opinion, are outside the authority of the city. I mean, and one of the problems that we have- All, all, the, all this says is a re review and recommendation of guidelines. It's not giving them an approval authority. It doesn't make any difference. The fact is, is that it it says that there will be guidelines that are not ordinances. Okay, uh, that that's a different that's a different topic. Mm -hmm. It is a different topic. Okay. That's why I wanted to, to to get it in there. All right. I'm sorry. I thought. Okay, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Commissioner Al Turk. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, I have a question about. Sorry, I was. Let me go back to the section on sidewalks. Um, what page are you on, sir? Um, let me. S oh, page sixteen. Yeah, it seems like that whole section has just been crossed out. And we relocated it on the next page under D one internal walkways. So internal walkways are the same thing as sidewalks. No, so, so th there's a difference. We have sidewalk standards. What that refers this section D that's being crossed out. Um, those are along common access drives, which are not public right away, so they're technically walkways. Sidewalks are public. Basically, we, we classify them as kind of public walkways. Um, if they're, uh, they're, they're the sidewalks. They're being correctly classified and just relocated in a different section, so we're keeping terminology consistent. Okay. And it's so that people won't misread it, saying that you have to have public sidewalks where it's private Correct. facilities. Correct. Right, thank you. That's the way I read it. Thank you. And I, um, I have the same concerns as Commissioner Miller and Ms. Pless. I, so aside from the legal question, I, I guess my, so let me start with a question. How many steps currently does it take to get from a neighborhood saying we want an NPO to the staff taking it up currently? I mean. Number of steps? Yeah, so um. JCCPC. <laughs> who, 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 I guess so. my, the main question is, does the governing body at this point review that process before? or the, review the request before it goes they do take They do take it into consideration when they're adopting the work program for the, for the planning department. So when Old West Durham was first submitted, they were an only submittal, kind of like Forest Hills was an only submittal, and they were prioritized, just like Forest Hills was only. To, but there was no staffing or resources to do it, so it remained as a priority for 18 months. And, re and the work program came up again. There's still no resources for it, so it kind of died on the vine. And Old West Durham resubmitted again, and it stayed on the work, and it was still discussed on work programs. And finally, when there was resources available, it moved up on the work program to actually do it. Right. That's the process that Forest Hills would be going through now. So it's effectively the council saying through the work program, and correct me if I'm wrong, do this or don't do it at this time. But you're asking. Um, this is basically 
trying to codify that process in a more uh, 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 a clearer way. Um, I take uh, Commissioner uh, Miller's comments uh, to point and we'll review that legality aspect of, of, of the mandating only through city council um, and then if necessary put in that relief valve other way of doing it. Um, but otherwise everything that's in here is generally mimicking what the current process is in terms of requirements and such but they're in the form of guidelines um, that were adopted by JCCPC, so we're codifying those. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I could, Sarah Young, I think to answer your question, there is essentially one more step being added, which is this formal going to the governing body and finding out whether or not they will prioritize it. And we see this actually as a benefit to neighborhoods because one of the lessons we learned, for instance, with the Golden Belt Local Historic District, which is very similar in many aspects to a neighborhood protection overlay in terms of how it's developed and the amount of uh, community input uh, that has to be put into the development of the district is that that, that sat basically for a decade almost um, before resources could be put towards it. And it finally came to a head when it was brought before the governing body who said, oh, wait a minute, we'll give you money to hire a consultant to do this, to move this along. So this is giving an opportunity to have that audience with the council in a very direct way for them to be able to allocate resources or to say prioritize this over that without having to necessarily wait till the annual work program comes up and you have a ton of other competing things. So while it is technically, yes, one more step, um, it, we feel like it potentially has some benefits. It, but, but you are asking them explicitly to um, review the, the application for whether there's substantial level of support from the neighborhood, for example, right? I mean, you say in here that, you know, is there a substantial level of support by residents? And so then does that open up a public hearing at, at that point, or is it just a... It, it's not a public hearing, and I, and I will say that many of the things that are in here that are now codified that were part of the original guidelines were things that the elected officials, both originally with the original NPO process, have asked for. These are the kind of things that they want to know when one of these moves forwards. And they're the kind of things that the current council, when they heard the most recent one, were still asking about. So um, the, the guidance that we've received so far is that these are legitimate questions to be asked of applicants in order for a decision to be made. Okay. Okay, thank you. I, I, I am a little concerned that that this seems to add some steps that make it maybe more difficult for residents to, to initiate this process, um, and I, I don't think we should be making it more difficult, but um, yeah, I, that, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Good, thank you. Any, any other, uh, Commissioner Baker? Uh, just a quick question. Um, the two additional dwelling units um, for the affordable housing bonus, I'm just curious, um, where did where did the two come from? Um, it was just a nominal step up from a one-to-one, -one, um, just taking that next step. I think our development review team had been discussing uh, projects with um, some potential applicants, and they said that it might be more feasible to do it that way than okay. just a one-to-one. -one. Um, and then just one other question, um, 1361, connectivity defined. Um, that's on page 18. Um, I'm looking at... And really, the, the change that's being proposed here is simply um, clarifying a sentence. Um, but I just wanted to ask, so this provision benefits a developer who just wants to put a bend in the road? So it, what's interesting about this is that we had that the cross-out standard is already there, which talks about a bend in the road. Mm -hmm. And then this standard that we have in there was embedded in the linear block definition, um, which we're consolidating into just block face because we actually had a linear block definition and a block face, which are generally the same things, and there are slightly two different definitions, and they were used differently in the ordinance, and one of them had this in there. And one of the things that Development Review had come to us to say is that the 75 degree thing can be gamed. Mm -hmm. um, there's no, spe the, the specificity of it is, is loose. Um, and then when we were so, it was like, do we keep it, do we not keep it, that kind of thing. And then when I was going through the ordinance and discovered, wait a minute, we have another way of measuring it, which is much more uh, concrete. And they're like, yep, that would work. 
And so we just replaced it with that. Okay. So, but this is just kind of encouraging a bend in the road. Correct. Correct. It's a, it's giving credit for a bend. Mm -hmm. Okay. A significant bend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, connectivity I think is really important. So, I would um, I would encourage uh, you know cons I think the connectivity index right now is one point four. Is mm -hmm. that correct? I would just encourage maybe maybe looking into um, in the future considering something a little bit higher, maybe 1.5 or 1.6. So, but other than that, sure, that's good. Great, thank you, Commissioner Miller. Yeah, to go back, I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Alturk. There is when you read these new NPO initiation standards, there's a witch's broomstick quality to it that I don't, that's not attractive to me, um, and so I would like to figure out some other way. Um, and have we looked at, I mean, Chapel Hill has many more neighborhood conservation overlays than we do. Raleigh has many more cons neighborhood conservation overlays than we do. How do they do it? They have set numbers, and they all turn out to be protection, suburban things, except for one in Chapel Hill. No, but the initiation but the, process. The initiation is, process, I don't remember the exact initiation process, but... I have a feeling it goes through the governing body at some point. Well, yeah, I don't have a problem with yeah. it going through the governing body. It's just the, it's the the daunting nature of this of gathering information and what have you. It seems to me that we have moved to the front end, uh, a whole bunch of, of standards considerations that actually are part of the final decision making process, not the front end. Uh, and so we've set a very high bar. You've got to show that the houses are a certain age and a certain number of lots are developed. We don't even say what a developed lot is, do we? And I and I worry about, I mean, my neighborhood might be able to pull it off. Forest Hill certainly has the resources to pull it off, but that's not really a very good standard. And we and quite frankly, my neighborhood's talking about an NPO too, but I don't see it as a as a big issue and and uh, for where we are, but there are other neighborhoods that I think definitely need to have NPOs. Uh, and I look at, the, and the reason they need the NPO is uh, because they are getting a little bit shredded. I wonder whether uh, uh, Old West Durham could have assembled the application that you are, are have described in this. I, I'm concerned about it, and I would like to, del I don't want this to go uh, for a vote to city council and board of commissioners. I think we need to talk about it more. So I'm gonna, and if, if we can't separate it, then I have to vote against the whole omnibus. Right. Any additional questions or comments? Uh, one. Commissioner Gibbs, and then, then we're gonna, we are gonna move to a motion, even if it's a motion to vote to approve or vote to delay. <coughs> with, all, <coughs> with all of these NPOs, uh, neighborhoods, neighborhoods, neighborhoods applying and being okay. What happens when they get so dense, they get to the point where it would be better to go to the Durham City, County, or whatever border and say everything within the city limits is an NPO? I don't know if I can answer that. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what you're well, asking. We have, we I have guess zone, it, yeah, we it have meets the 15 acre requirement. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess it's sort of cynicism because I don't, uh, I think there should be more restrictive rules for even having them. But anyway, I, that's I understand. That's just. And I apologize for the cynicism, but anyway, thank you. No problem. So, Mr. Stock, if, if I may, what are the implications if there would be a delay on sending this forward tonight? I can't, I don't know of any specific implications um, beyond the fact that it would just delay it moving forward. Mm -hmm. no. And the reason I ask is I was at the first JCCPC meeting where this came up. And, and I was not at the second meeting. Uh, I was out of town and, and Vice Chair Hyman was, was there. But my recollection of the discussion was this combination of let's make sure this is a tool that does work for neighborhoods 
and let's try to build in some level of certainty because what we did here in Old West Durham was, and we all heard it at that the, the hearing here, and were people saying, I didn't know about this. Uh, some people complained about it took forever, and some people said this thing was already baked in before I even knew about it. So I see this as putting in some of the guardrails to help deal with that later concern, and I think that's important. But I do understand Ms. Plus's comments and my fellow commissioners' concerns that we don't want to set the bar too high either. The, the whole point is that this is the one citizen tool available. And so it does strike me that if we can pause this for a month or two to get it right, if that is helpful, that seems like it would be valuable. If, if I could get some clarification as to the specific things you would like to see reconsidered, besides the legality question that Commissioner Miller has already raised, because one month, I, I'm not quite sure what we're looking to change. Um, we looked at, we kept this, the current standards in terms of the 15% and, and that, we didn't really change that. We didn't hear that those were a concern. We heard the concerns of yes, this was already baked before, or notification when they were even just considering it, they wanted better notification, that kind of thing. And then even just clarifying that it needs to kind of go through city council or the, or the board of commissioners, depending upon. So that's what we did focus on. So if we can get a better idea of what the specific concerns are that are that these, or that these changes are making that are hampering other neighborhoods from doing it and we can take those into consideration. Again, a lot of those are larger policy questions um, that might take longer than the month to turn it around. So I would say a month is actually not even uh, reasonable. I, I think that's right. So it, I guess the question would be if we did have a two cycle delay on having this come back to us specifically to, to spend time on part eight to make sure that we are not setting up too high of a barrier for the various neighborhoods in Durham to be able to actually use this as a tool. It sounds like you're saying that may be annoying and frustrating maybe for you personally and for the staff, but it does not set us back as a community in terms of some significant deadline that we need to meet. I'm not aware of that. And I'll just say, do we want to, if we're, are we talking about pulling the NPO out portion out entirely and moving the omnibus forward? If, if, if we that, can. That might be the better thing at that point. If you're looking to really hold back on it, then let's just move the, the omnibus forward without that section, and then we'll <coughs> just have it as a separate standalone text amendment. I see a lot of heads nodding, and I, I think we all appreciate your willingness to, to take that step. I have learned and been reminded that I, as chair, cannot make that motion, but I will happily <laughs> accept that motion from someone else. Mr. Chairman, I move that. Um, oh. Michael, can I just give you I'm one sorry. nit on page 31? Sorry. Sure. You're just missing the extra, the second S in states in 17.3. I was wondering when a typo was going to be. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> where, where was it on 31? I'm sorry. 17.3 in the definition of cluster box unit. You're just missing the second S in states. Okay, thank you. All right. And with that, back to our motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that we send case TC18, quadruple zero two, forward to the City Council and Board of County Commissioners um, with a favorable recommendation, except for uh, the several uh, questions and corrections that we uh, identified for staff, and except for section eight concerning the uh, process related to the neighborhood protection overlay ordinance and that our recommendation be that with regard to that section that we uh, bring it back to the Planning Commission at the Commission's December 11th meeting we would just I would just suggest that we'll, we'll just pull Send it out it back it'll to be staff. a separate text amendment we'll refer it back to staff and we'll bring it to you when I recommend that with regard to section 8 we refer that back to staff and send all the rest forward there is a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Al Turk. Any discussion? We will have a roll call vote, please. Um, Commissioner Al Turk. Yes. Commissioner Baker. Yes. Commissioner Durkin. Yes. Commissioner Hyman. Yes. Commissioner Busby. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner Kanchin. Yes. Commissioner Gibbs. 
Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. So the um, motion with the um, exceptions passes 9 0. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stock. Uh, anything for next month that we need to know of? Yeah, don't go. So, um, <laughs> have the list in front of you. If you have any questions, let me or the case planner know. And I believe um, the assistant director may have an announcement real quick. Great. So real briefly, I wanted to follow up with you all. You've made um, several requests about long range planning, comprehensive projects coming to you earlier, having more kind of advanced notice, getting to hear a little more about it uh, before, even before the informational item that we traditionally do before the public hearing. And I have talked with the, uh, the staff this week, and something new that we would like to roll out to you is, and I can't promise it'll be every single month, we will watch your agenda and do what makes sense, but um, maybe at least every other month have a brief summary, at least, of kind of pending projects and where they are that gives you, at the very minimum, a chance to ask us questions and we can kind of delve a little deeper um, on anything, not necessarily formal presentations, mind you, but the opportunity for discussion and conversations. And that will also kind of give us a heads up of things that you may be more or less interested in that we can then do kind of deeper dives in subsequent meetings. So I hope that you all, that, that will kind of meet your needs um, and we'll give that a try. Thank you for being responsive. We really appreciate it. That's great. All right, we are adjourned.